It's liquid lunch coming at you on a Tuesday. Wait, let me get my cell phone out, Sandra. Okay, make sure it's so on quiet. Just so I can see what so we're starting today. Hey. Oh, are you supposed to take it out? No. You're supposed to take it out and answer it if it rings me. We just, yes. Because we're... even you're on air? Even really? Even you're on air, yeah. He's That's kidding. No, I'm not. Well, he does that. Don't do as he says, not because as he does. think about it. When you're watching Johnny Carson or, you know, Johnny Carson. Speaking uh, of. What? Johnny Carson or Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, or any of those guys. Did you see that? Johnny Cash? Uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> Johnny Cash. I mean, he, it's Johnny Cash. Who would have thought a financial person has a sense of humor? Well, she's, yeah. <laughs> Maybe oh, thank talk, you. You're doing great. This is great already. We're starting off, and this is good. You're just chiming in on stuff. Now I feel I can ask you about the aliens, right? The aliens, mm -hmm. sure. We can talk about aliens. Yeah. There's no financial system up there, though, right? No, there are. They have spaceships filled with cash. Oh. Well, I that... thought I thought we were talking about newcomers in the country, the aliens. Oh, those aliens. Oh, <laughs> oh those kinds of al illegal or li illegal aliens. Do you remember that movie, Alien Nation? Did you ever see that movie? I only... No. Do you remember it? No, Maybe? I haven't seen it, actually. What is it about? Well, it's basically, it's about... Uh, a bunch of aliens, like from another planet, they landed and then they just sort of, they moved into, it was said in California, they were like just another immigrant group. No, but how did California. they have their IDs going on? That's the problem. Well, right? they were refugees. Oh, okay. So they were taken oh, in by okay. the government, just like, you know, right. any refugees. group of refugees. And they were, they settled in to Los Angeles and the movie was like a cop. And his partner, and his partner was one of these aliens, oh, right? That's interesting. And it was kind of taking that, looking at the whole immigration issue, but taking it one step further, as if you know, off-planet people mm -hmm. came and settled in. Mm -hmm. It was a really interesting concept, alienation. I don't know if who's ever seen that. Well, it's technically, good. when when we all first came into the country, it had that feel. feel. Yeah. You know, it's like coming Everything. from the space. You because you don't know the system, you don't know what to do, and you know all that stuff. So, you weren't born here then? No, I Amy? Where were you born? I was born in Hong Kong. And I came when I was 16 years old. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you came to When you were Toronto? 16? With your parents? Yep. And how, how did you feel, I'm just curious, how did you feel, you know, when the, your parents said to you, when you were, you know, we're going to move from Hong Kong to Canada? Okay, that was actually a mix of feelings, because mm -hmm. at the time when we were all fleeting out from Hong Kong is because of the handover in 1997, so everybody wants out. Was Nobody knew what that what was going to happen. happen. I know, yeah. Exactly, yeah. so everybody wants out. So in mm -hmm. a way, that was a happy thing, but at the same time, it was so shocked because um, I didn't know about it uh, like well before. Mm -hmm. Well ahead. Mm -hmm. So I was told, and then I had to go in, like, I can't remember, like, two or three months, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I was sort of prepared for my life uh -huh. in Hong Kong at the right. time, and then all of a sudden, no, you're leaving. Yeah. So, like, I had wow. no friends and, you know, nobody. I know nobody here. And you're right? only six, so you were in high school. Yes, still, I was in right? high school. So, yeah, that must that's, have been a big shock, shock, right? That's a culture shock. and Totally. I had oh, a yeah. culture shock. I had actually a culture shock. So yeah. what happened? Did you get depressed or... Uh, well, I was actually pretty lucky in a way because I, I came over, well, lucky and unlucky, I came over in the middle of winter. So I was here in November, mid-November, so yeah. snow all around and everything. The school that I was supposed to go was a semester school. Uh -huh. So they were in, in the middle of midterms. Yeah. So they were saying, well, there's no point for you to start now. Mm -hmm. So why don't you wait till yeah. February? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was like going, okay, so I, I'm wasting two months. Yeah in my life doing nothing because I have been, you know, have to wait. So in that two months, I've been traveling from my home, which is, which was in the Rexdale, mm -hmm. taking TTC down to downtown mm -hmm. every day just mm -hmm. to explore mm -hmm. what's the Toronto like, what am I going to do here, figure out 
what's my future is going to look like. Now that takes a lot of courage to do, especially when you're in this whole new land. Now, could, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you spoke English very well and understood English, right? Uh, well, we we had English. Teaching stuff there, yes. So you, you could ask for directions and things like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's it takes a great deal of courage, first of all, to move on short notice at that age, and second, I had no choice. Well, I know, but <laughs> you, and, but it still takes courage to have to do that. You still, I mean, you could have stayed in your room, and just done nothing for two two months. Oh yes, that's that's true. That's true. You know, and so for the fact that you did that, wow, that speaks a lot to your character and oh, your fortitude. Thank you. Don't you think? Yes. <laughs> No, I think it's got to be tough oh my to, God. for anybody to pick up from one culture, one country, one language, and move to a different one. Yeah. I, I mean, when I, I moved at 17 from Sudbury to here, to Toronto. Sudbury? Yeah, up mm. north. And right. oh my God, I was freaked out. <laughs> By the culture here, and I'm still, and I'm from here, but I've never seen a subway, and you know, I was afraid to take the subway. I was not used to that many people and, and the different cultural diversity, because there's not a lot of that. So for me, that was a culture shock, and right. it took me a long time to actually have the courage to get up and take the subway, and um, uh, and even to drive on the highways, because none of that is. Don't even laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking about thinking about the culture shock of somebody from Toronto going to Sudbury. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so funny. <laughs> they would need deep counseling. Uh, I, I went there once, and it was uh, in January, I think, and it was like minus 30, just like it is today. <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> Toronto. In March. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it yeah. is. I mean, so I can I, I can imagine what yours would have been like because I'm still in Canada. I'm still in, in the same province. Uh, so I can, and for me, that was a culture shock. So I can imagine what it would be to come from another. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't easy because, like, at the time, I was actually thinking to get into advertising. Mm -hmm. And advertising is a very, very cultural-related yes, thing. Yes, yes. Sure. So yeah. when yeah. I knew that I had to leave what where I was, I know already I couldn't do advertising anymore. Right. And I had no clue, okay, what am I going to do now? Like, uh -huh. totally blank. At 16 years old, I thought I had my... Life planned, and then no, <laughs> that's not happening. Right. Wow, isn't so, that funny? Yeah, so here, so then what happened? So you were 16 in high school, and then, so what did you do? And, uh, you know, when you had to reevaluate your career choice? Well, technically what happened was uh, I, I rushed off my high school because I got pushed down from grade 11. Like, technically, they didn't give me all the grade 11 credits. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have enough time. Mm -hmm. And I wasted two months in my life, so I had to rush my three grades in three semesters. Oh, wow. So I got that done. I just went into university wow. and get my degree, and then I'm, like, going, okay, I'm still not too sure what I'm going to do. Okay, where'd you go, and what degree did you get? I, go, I was in University of Waterloo. Yeah. And... Uh, I start off with engineering, but I finish with the Bachelor of Science. Bachelor of Science. I went to Laurier. Oh. Yeah. That's very close. Did you ever go to the turret? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even even go to the uh, bomb, sh bomb shelter or the uh, the um, what's it called the uh, the the nightclub uh, on campus. I can't remember. Where at Laurier or at Waterloo? Uh, at Waterloo. Oh. Yeah, that that was supposed to be the Ontario largest on-campus nightclub at the time. Wow. Yeah. They probably didn't have that when I was there. Now I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was. Between Laurier, because those are, and, and, and um, Waterloo, because those are considered very, very smart universities, if I could say that. Hugh accepted. But <laughs> well, I did, well. What did you do here? Well, I, I know Waterloo for math and, and computer so it science, on right? The programs. And, and engineering. Engineering. Yeah. And, and then and, and Laurier, Laurier for business. Laurier for business. Right, yes. which is. Yeah. Uh, and it was it good? Did you think it was good? It was supposed to be good. Hello. Yeah. You didn't really <laughs> learn anything. Because <laughs> you were too busy at the okay, pub. Don't tell anybody that. <laughs> you were too busy at the pub. There was a big snowball fight, I remember. It was the biggest snowball fight ever. Oh, Seriously. So you know what? Yeah. Your pictures in the hallways of Laurier for being, you know, you know, they have all the graduate pictures. Okay, they're going to have a big frame for all the people who are in the biggest snowball fight It was fight a huge ever. snowball fight. There's Let me tell you what Harley. happened. Anyways, that, 
I won't get into it, but it was a huge, massive snowball fight. Every wow, re person so living in residence on campus, there was a giant war between two all residents the, between all the different residences. Oh wow! Yeah. So it wasn't like Kappa Alpha Omega against. No, we didn't so, have uh, fraternities, fraternity but no. it was just you know one residence against the other residence. And uh, wow. anyways, it was. But that must be fun, though. It was fun. That it, must be it, fun. It really was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we should say who Mimi is, shouldn't we? Yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> Actually, before we do that, let's just tell people who, because yeah. this is not even the official interview, Mimi. This, this is, is not just the, us. This is the, the, the banter. The banter. But uh, actually, I just want to say who else is coming on the show. Uh, Lynn Adamson's coming on the show. Uh, Ritu Parna Basu is coming on the show. She's with uh, the Ayn Rand Institute. Okay. We're going to be talking about. Uh, she's oh, in Toronto. God, we talked about this last week. You said we have a guest coming on from that. That's yeah. right. And she's in town from okay. California. She's. Uh, they're giving. Uh, uh, they have an event tonight at the U of T, talking about health care and what's wrong with the uh, Canadian health care system and what how. Ayn Rand's ideas can help. Okay. Which reminds me of a lyric from a song. And then we have? Uh, we have uh, Sandra Saradisi. And she's all about uh, healing of the heart. Wow. Yeah. That and also, who else? Show. Who else? Oh, uh, I don't know. You know, it's like uh, maybe Joshua's coming on the show. Maybe Ilya's coming on the show. Maybe Omar's coming on the show. We could be we here, just, we we could be here all afternoon. Guests. Yeah, we do. So let's get busy with Mimi, who... Mimi Lee. After all that, Mimi, you did decide to go in a certain direction with your career, right? So let's... It wasn't let's... advertising. No, it was not. <laughs> so let's get into it. So what is it? I am a financial advisor now. Okay. That's a very, very different thing. I would never imagine that in like 20 years ago <laughs> so what where what made you decide to do that because you did you went to to laurier i no. mean to 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 waterloo. um waterloo for engineering you thought you were going to be in advertising you changed to science well, and now you're I doing was, financial advising i was technically always in science because um in in the culture in hong kong uh if you do if you are not doing business or science you, oh, you can't go anywhere so even though at the time i really loved my advertising side of the things mm -hmm. I had to take extra courses in order to go to advertising if I wanted to okay so I had science courses all oh, the time okay 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 yeah. so, so that's, that that's, was your foundation yes exactly so okay. that was why when I came over I had to rush and whatever I just continue with my science stream okay okay yeah. I see okay so, um, makes sense so then how did you make the jump to financial actually the, that advising. was not even direct I had gone somewhere else before I came to the financial industry. Oh. Should we talk about that? Yeah. Sure. The journey. <laughs> <laughs> so after I rushed off my degree, it is obviously I didn't still not too sure what I was going to do. And uh, <clears throat> I went back to Hong Kong, actually, after I graduated. And I picked up a job, which was a Chinese computer magazine editor. Oh, wow. I didn't have well enough Chinese, in my opinion. I did not have any computer-related studies. I was not in journalism. And the guy hired me, hired me simply because I was a University of Wolu alumni. Oh, wow. Was he too? Is that yes. what? Yes. Ah, cool. It's like 90% um, of his uh, company at the time See, that's how I need to get a job, because I certainly can't qualify based on qualifications. So Snowball I need to know fights. somebody. Well, I know him. Well, yeah, I know, but you still have the, that. You did through the well. Thing. Check, check your Laurier <laughs> networking. Go back to the snowball fight. Go back to the snowball fight. Yeah, that Who was on your team. Actually. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get back to Mimi here. Um. Anyway, so uh, I I got like it was the oddest way I got that job actually I got it from a labor department oh. and then I didn't even know like of course I didn't know him I didn't know where he came from and all that stuff but mm -hmm. then we went through the interview and he was like oh sure you know like start whenever you know that kind of stuff and afterwards I figured oh this guy was a 
my first year while I was a student. And then I found out a lot of colleagues are in person while we alumni or co-op students. Wow, isn't that interesting? Yeah, I know. So you end up being an editor, mm -hmm. and then how did that make? How did you make the jump over? That was very interesting because I was in the editorial role for about like well different companies. I was there only for three months, and then I jumped to another another magazine. So I was in the computer magazines for about a year and a half, and then I moved to a business related magazine. And okay. then I was tired of magazine because we have to go through the same article over and over and over and over again right. just because it was not published yet. Wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. like because yeah. it's a monthly magazine, so I, we have a lot of time on one article, right? Wow. Yeah. So I didn't like it. And then I started my newspaper mm. life. So I was a reporter to start with and then I was there another year or so and then I was able to get myself into a financial newspaper editor. Uh huh. That's mm. where I learned all my financial stuff. Okay. Because I'm the first reader. Yeah. I have to know what the heck is going on. If nobody if I don't know what this means, yeah. how can any reader knows what's going on, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I asked a lot of questions. I had all those stuff answered by the reporters, and we researched and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, so that's how it started. Wow. So then, so how did you get back to Canada, and then how did you get into uh, what to, you're doing now? I got back to Canada because I got laid off by, at the time, I was a web news editor. Um, it was a Taiwanese TV station. So I got laid off. And so I had. Were you in Thai, Taiwan at the time, or still in Hong no, Kong? No, I was still in Hong Kong. I see. But they were Mandarin-speaking Taiwanese uh, TV station. Do you know Phoenix Kong? That is actually very familiar. I'm just asking because I know but, I know her. She's a friend of mine, and she worked for a Thai, Taiwanese TV but station. But we do have a few Taiwanese TV stations. Yeah, though. I know. I know. I just... <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So. So I had my baggage, mm -hmm. but I knew if I sit around with that baggage, it's going to be drained very fast. Mm -hmm. And I knew for a fact that at that time, because we had the tech bubble boost and, and all that stuff, I knew I couldn't go back to media as well with mm -hmm. the same kind of pay mm -hmm. that I was getting. So I, through another friend of mine, I got a reporter job in here. And I just grabbed my son and came over. Like another really rush relocation happened. I guess I had a I had a shock to my son. At you that did time. to your son when what was done uh. to you. Yeah, yeah. But he was young enough, so he he should be he He's should be fine. fine. I hope. I don't know. I haven't actually asked him. He How was, long have you been here, Mimi? Now we came back two thousand one. Okay. Yeah, okay. So he so. was three years old. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's so that's 13, fine. Thirteen that years fine. now. Okay. And uh, yeah, so we came back, and I continued that uh, reporter job for a while, and I I I couldn't I couldn't adapt to it. It was uh, it was very different from like the it's like a community paper that I'm working mm -hmm. in here compared mm -hmm. to a international really exciting news that I was working okay. in Hong Kong. Yeah, so I could so uh, yeah. see how that would be very disappointing. So <laughs> now what are you doing? What do you mean? Now what am I so doing? So now with as your, a financial, with your true yeah. Financial. What am I doing? I am actually uh, helping people to reorganize their finances a lot of times, uh, budgeting and things like that, uh, help them save money for down payments, you know. And uh, for people who already have money, you know, try to preserve their money, save tax. So, so you're talking about like investing and things like how to invest and what to invest in and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. And for Savings. retirement yeah. and all of that stuff. You know, I just have to say, you know, it's one, it's, you know, people, I think this is a, a growing field, right? Where people, because people in the past tended to look after their own financial mm -hmm. situation. But I think now... Just the way things are and the complexity of the tax structure, it really helps for everybody to have a financial advisor. It actually helps a lot because, like, there are surveys and studies out there saying that you know people have financial advisors actually do a lot better. Yeah. They have like at least one third of wealth 
uh, accumulated more than the people who, who don't sure. have. That and even much. people that you know might think that even buying a house is something they're never going to be able to afford. Mm -hmm. The time to start planning is now. Yes. Right. Yes, absolutely. Because it it's possible. It's always possible. It's just that whether you actually take the initiative and and also like. Yeah. to actually do it, right? You know, you know what's really uh, interesting is you talk about buying a house, and a lot of people in North America talk about buying a house as the thing to do for financial stability and all of that, but um, there are people who prefer not to. They prefer to continue to rent and take their money and invest it elsewhere, and there are other parts of the world where buying a house is not the ultimate goal. That's not part of the dream plan. In, in places in Europe, in, uh, in I think in... Uh, other Middle East countries, it's not, you don't want to own a house. That actually is more imprisoned. I've talked to some people about that, and, and they're very wealthy, so they could buy a house, but it's mm -hmm. not what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So there's also perception around what we consider to be valuable and what we don't consider to be valuable. That's my point. And yeah. you talked about it. I know in Canada, it's a big, big, big thing. Everybody's, we got to buy a house, we got to buy a house. We're brainwashed. You're not successful mm -hmm. if you don't own a property. Well, it actually really depends on the uh, society structure and, and influence. Influence as well as uh, how that whole economic within that society as well, right? Because, like, I think the reason why Canadians are getting more and more into buying real estate is because the real estate market has been going over the roof for the last two decades, right? But doesn't that mean it's going to flop somewhere, just like stocks? It can't go up forever, correct? Well, that's something that everybody has been arguing and debating for the longest time, right? And uh, there's this... Um, Benjamin Tai, I, I, I don't know if you guys know about him. He's uh, one of the CIBC economists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, he keeps saying that, you know, the, the real estate market in Canada is like cats. They have nine lives. Whatever is supposed to boom, crash, something happens and it continues. It's so, it's so ironic because, ironically, I was listening to this very topic driving in today and they were talking about the real estate market in the 416 and the 905 area code and one so-called expert was saying there's going to be a 30% correction mm -hmm. and the other guy was saying that's baloney. Every time we hear that something happens and it's not the case exactly. and he said you know I just this guy was talking he said I just bought a house myself mm -hmm. um, and I paid 17% over and I'm not talking about me I'm talking about the guy who was interviewed. I paid 17% over the asking price wow. and and he said and but I was in the four he was in the 41 416 area code but he said the 905 is going through the roof North York is going through the roof and he said um, so that the other guy asked him he said do you think if you were to turn that around right now and sell it you would make 17% you would make it back and he said I would make more now because now we're getting into the hot time this yeah. now we're the real estate market is in March and April that's when it gets really hot and he bought it in like January when it's not so hot. So he said he would likely make even more. So he said there is no correction and, he, and he, it just seems to be going and going and going and going and going. But the concern for me is the international people who are actually coming in and buying the property. A lot of people from Hong Kong are actually the international buyers. So how much is actually kept domestic? And that can, that can screw up the rates and give us a lot of false numbers as, as well, could it not? Well, actually, believe it or not, a lot of um, international people coming from is actually from China. Okay. And uh, the way that they buy houses is that they give you punk, the cash on table and they don't even need anything going on. So you they just, don't need financing or anything. Exactly. You know, and, and that's exactly one of the reasons why the real estate has been going so hot. Because it's an international market now. Exactly. Yeah. Because Which is not fair to the people who actually have to work here because then the prices are so much higher right. than the working class and the people in here can afford. Well, that's the problem, right? But then at the same time, it's a, it's a free market. You know, that you, you, you can't say that because you're an international buyer, I'm not going to sell it to you. But shouldn't there be some sort of government regulation to protect? Just like there's all kinds of government regulation around our CRTC and you know radio and all of that shouldn't there be some sort of regulation that puts a cap on that that says no no we have to make this feasible for the people who are actually living here that is a very big question exactly it's a big question <laughs> and it's a very complex thing yeah, if, we, if complex. anybody would want to 
like put it together. So Mimi, we should have you back and we can talk about that in more detail, that complex question. But before, okay. but, and we don't have a lot of time left, but, what, but I want to ask you, True Financial, because that's the company mm -hmm. that you're with. Yes. Tell us what's unique and special about True Financial and, and why, why would we it's come a good to idea for people to come and talk to you. Um, well, True Financial actually helps people in their own unique way. Like, it really depends on what your situation looks like, and we tailor-made everything for you. So whether you need is a credit built or you, you have some money already, you want to grow it more, it really based on what your goals are and uh, what you'd like to see in 5, 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. How about if people don't know what their goals are? Can you help with to create, I, yes. design those and... Yeah, well, goals. because what happened is initial meeting is like to me uh, for any new prospect or new clients is usually at least two hours to two and a half hours long. So we we chat a lot on, of course, what do you have now? Like what kind of income you have now? Mm -hmm. uh, like where you are right now? Mm -hmm. But then a lot of times actually spent on what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself? Um, do you want to pay less tax or do you want to do what you know so that explore mm -hmm. is at least two and a half hours and most of the time we go longer than that i had like four hours or five hours in need of initial meetings yes. are those free consultations those yes. initial meetings you know that's a great thing to do because really in, in that sense you're listening a lot yeah. you're getting to know your customers what they their situation what they might want, yeah. you know, developing a relationship. helping, developing mm -hmm. that relationship, helping them to form their goals if they don't have any. Yeah, and then sure. from there, you, I guess you can go and come up with a plan for them, right? Usually what happens is I'll take all that we have discussed. Mm -hmm. I will come go back to my chair and then I crunch their numbers and come up with something like an action plan yeah. in a week or two. And then we'll try to, like, I will present them, you know, this is what, we, actually, I will give them an email to wrap up the the meeting that we had right and then i would actually at the, that meeting already i would tell them you know this is what i'm going to look into yeah. we will try to do this we'll try to look at into that, that you know, yeah. and stuff yeah. like that so yeah. in that email gives gives them a recap on what we've talked about in that nice. two and a half hours or whatever and then i'll come back with some sort of a suggestion in two weeks or so and, and then kicking who, something. Who okay. do you find are your main? Are you dealing with younger people or older people? Is it or is it across the board? I'm actually having a lot of small businesses. Okay. Um, they they have like usually small businesses, and then uh, they have young families. Yes. And uh, one of my my main thing is how to protect your personal finances away from your business oh, and that's a big thing because yes. a lot of people lose yeah. everything that's a really good point yes and and that's the thing like when you build your business it's like your baby right yeah but then at the same time your actual baby is at home yeah but then once anything happens to your business it, affects. it actually affects your family right there on the spot so um so those are those are my main clients and uh, lately I have a lot of referrals from my clients which are their parents so I'm oh. doing a lot of uh, actual retirement thing going on as well okay so Mimi listen thanks for coming in today love to have you back and get into some of these other topics but uh, now if people are resonating and they want to get in touch and maybe get their financial house in order what's the best way for them to do that the best way is actually go to my website triple w true financial with t r u no e .ca. Truefinancial.ca. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. Thank you okay, so Mimi. much. Thank you for having me. And we will see you soon. Yeah. Thank okay. you. And we've got a little video that you gave to us uh, uh, of you talking about this stuff. So we're going to watch this now and we're going to come back with Ridu Parna Basu right after this. We'll be right back. The panel format is actually not so bad because, like, uh, we're not talking about a whole bunch of people. Like, it's not a large panel as well as not, like, only two people kind of debating. Like, pretty average, I would say. Perfect. And 
What would you say you gained from attending this event? Um, to understand, again, you know, like what's the fund manager, um, kind of like how they think, and in terms then we kind of reflect how we can think to choose what fund manager that we would like to use as well. And how would you describe today's event to your colleagues or peers when you go back to the office? Um, I think I will let them know it's a very good uh, way to understand the world economy um, in the circumstances that we are in right now. And you know, I mean, you're lucky down well, there. We, we have thick skin. <laughs> yeah, I'm betting. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. So how so. do you pronounce your name? I'm sorry. Ritu Parna. Ritu Parna. But Ritu works here. Ritu, easy. Okay. okay. Ritu's easy to work with, uh, so <laughs> that's great. And uh, now you're here in town because there's an event tonight. Uh, I don't know if we could show the, uh, the graphic. Uh, this is the event tonight at the U of T, uh, the Earth Sciences Building. And... Maybe you can just summarize what the topic of the event that you're going to be speaking tonight is sure. about. So the title is The Disease Killing Canadian Healthcare. It's a dramatic. Wow. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, I'm from America, and so I kind of have the benefit of ha you know, knowing what the American system is like. And, you know, it's interesting that so many Canadians come to America for their health care. More than 40,000 Canadians every year come to America for their health care. And I think part of it is because American health care, you know, compared to all the other health care systems around the world, delivers the best quality care. And, you know, we don't have to wait as long. Like in Canada, you have to wait more than four months to see a specialist. In the United States, you have to wait three weeks. Now, if you're in pain, you don't want to be waiting four months. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what is it? It's the fact that the government totally controls health care in Canada, and we shouldn't want that. In, in America, we have more of a market, and that delivers better care. That's what Canadians should be aiming for. But let me, let me uh, um, ask the people who are utilizing the U.S. Um, facilities, they're doing so at a very <clears throat> excuse me, expensive cost, correct? Because yeah, they have, have to, to pay, pay for, for it. Care, but you know, you pay for what you get. And but what Canada, if you, you can't? Don't always get very much. So let me ask you, it, um, it, uh, apple for apple, okay, if somebody needed that emergency health care in Canada, okay, and, and couldn't get it because, um, or had to wait four months instead of three weeks, like you're saying, but they don't have the money resources, they couldn't go to the U.S., right? Yeah, that's that's precisely the point. I mean, okay. the people who are going to the United States right now are the people who can afford to go. Right. You have Premier Danny Williams leaving uh, the Canadian system to go for uh, his heart surgery to the United States. My mom she went to Buffalo to get an MRI. Yeah, and so she pay for why it? should she have to, yeah. right? We should want that kind of system in Canada so people don't have to fly across the border. Yeah, but here's the de here's the thing. No, you have to forgive Sanders. She's a communist. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to forgive me for that, yeah. <laughs> Most Canadians are communists. That's why we have a from each according to their needs to each according to their yeah, abilities. Yeah, you have socialized medicine in this Healthcare country. system. But, you know, there's... And I'll admit, there I'm are not problems. I'm for forgiveness, by the way. I'm forgiving you Listen, I'm a communist for not too, being a communist and an objectivist. As you call it. Okay. You can't be both. No, I am both. But we'll, we can get into uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing is, um, like, we know that there's problems with the Canadian health care mm -hmm. system. For sure. Okay? For sure. We also know there's problems with the American health care system. Definitely. The way it was and I think had problems, and the way that it's moving towards with Obamacare is got a lot of problems too, yeah. right? So the thing is, uh, on the other hand, I, I know people who are Canadian who thank their lucky stars that they're Canadian when they come down with a serious illness and the system provides health care for them. Um, similarly, there are people in the United States who uh, are living paycheck to paycheck and if, if, if somebody in their family gets uh, seriously ill, they are, they've fallen through the cracks. So, can you tell me how the philosophy of Ayn Rand and objectivism can address that issue? Yeah, I definitely can. But before I do that, I do want to make clear. I mean, people think that the alternative is what, what Canadians have and then what Americans have. And it's true, the American health care system is nowhere near perfect. There's all sorts of problems. But if you look at it, the problems are actually caused because we are moving towards what you guys have. We are moving towards greater and greater government control of health care. And that's what's causing all sorts of problems in American health care as well. Is that the Obama 
thing you're talking about, the well, Obamacare? Well, there's Obamacare, but in American health care, government has been increasingly controlling it for the last hundred years. So, if, But if you look at the freer parts of American health care, if you look at the parts the government is not controlling as much, for example, LASIK surgery, right? Mm, surgery to okay, fix your eye. I see. That is less regulated. And what you've seen there over time, it's become more affordable. The quality has increased. More people can get it. Things are better. Healthcare works better when it's run like a business, not when it's run by the government. So do you think, because there have been statistics out there that show that the overall cost of health care in the U U.S. per capita, if you mm -hmm. have to divide it all up, is higher than, it's higher than in Canada, it's higher sure. than almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, is, are, are, are you saying that this, because that seems, you know, you, you want a system where it becomes as affordable to as many as possible. Sure. Uh, is, are you saying that these, this high cost of health care on average in the U.S. is caused by the move towards socialized medicine? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can't really even compare what it costs in Canada to what it costs in America. I mean, you've got government in, Amer in Canada, right, controlling all the prices. So it's not really a valid comparison to compare to America. And in America, we've got all sorts of government distortion. So that's not the greatest measure. I mean, to me, what's the most important measure is if I'm really sick, where do I want to be? And undoubtedly, you want to be in the United States. I mean, if you've got cancer, it's I not I think even Michael Moore would disagree with that, wouldn't he? Well, what if you have no money and you get sick? Where would you want to be? Well, that's part of the issue that because Good government question. has so distorted American health care, of course it's really, really expensive. But what do you see in the freer areas? You see over time things become way more affordable because people want, if people have legitimate medical needs, right, what happens on a market? On a market, people try to meet those needs. They try to do it in as efficiently as possible in a profitable way. And what you've seen in every other area of the economy, say technology, things get cheaper over time. More and more people can afford it, and they can afford it quicker, right? They don't have to wait four months. That's not the good system. So you're saying this is really the growing pains because of the resistance that's being um, had because there's partial regulation, partial free market is Absolutely. what you're saying. So if it yeah. all went to free market, it would, pe it would balance itself out and find its way I mean, to I the people. So that's what you're saying. Healthcare would be a lot cheaper on a free market, just like everything is cheaper on a free market. When has government well, been the no, one I, to I deliver I have to admit, quality? for sure, when the government ensures that pharmaceutical companies get paid exorbitant prices, arguably, for, for medicines, and that money is paid by the taxpayer, when you don't have individuals saying, no, that's too much, and you have the government saying, okay, we'll pay whatever you ask for the prices. For sure, that's going to inflate prices. Sure, I mean, that's supply and demand. Mm -hmm. That's the good thing about it. Consumers are really empowered, and they can bring those costs down. So when you, when you look at that, though, um, first of all, there, there is a danger, I think, as well in when you... When you pay for things the way you're saying, yeah. I mean, it, there's also a danger that people will rely too heavily on the medical system and not take enough responsibility. Like in the U.S., over 50% oh, yeah. of American population are taking prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. I see commercials all the time saying something like, oh, do you cry every day? Then you're depressed. It's, it's like it's unnatural to cry every day. Yeah. So there seems to be a push to put everybody on some form of medical, and you're not normal almost if you're not taking some sort of prescription drug now. So I think that there's, uh, um, a, the, the pendulum can swing the other way where we are just so drug happy and we also give so much power away that you take, when you're forced to have to go into a system that is with everybody, you also want to take more responsibility because you don't necessarily want to be hanging out in the hospitals because you know it's going to be a long wait. So what can I do myself to take responsibility for myself so that I can possibly avoid having to do that? Right. I mean, this is why you want a market, right? Because on a market, you are responsible for your own health care, which means that you have to pay for it, which means you're going to be very careful about what kind of medicines you take, what kind of treatments you undergo. In fact, what you see is in, in Canada, in America, where everyone's paying for everyone else's health care, people make all sorts of irresponsible decisions. And the rest of us are going, why is he doing that? Well, one way that people would be more responsible, more rational, is if they were actually paying for their own health care, if they're responsible for it. And that's what happens on a market. Mm. Mm -hmm. That that mm -hmm. could be argued either well, way. Well, you know, I think she <laughs> because I can she's see making how. some good points. Yeah, and absolutely. I know, uh, for example, my mom was a nurse, mm -hmm. right, uh, at the emergency department. And uh, she would come home and she'd tell stories about people would come into the hospital. And, this of course, here. this is in Canada. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's free, right, because it's 
Medicare. And they would, be, you know, maybe they were just didn't have anything to do that day, right? And so they're maybe feeling a little... But they would go down and they would mm -hmm. s take up the hospital resources. They weren't really that, they weren't really sick, right? But if they had to pay for that, for sure they would be more responsible about that. And I think that there are... For certain, yeah, I think I, for, I listen, totally, totally right? I'm on the other side of this. I totally do not see that at all. What? No, it's true. No. Well, <laughs> it's true to you. But no, I mean, that's I, as soon as you equate, I mean, you're more responsible when you're paying for something yourself. Right? But when you equate health with dollars, mm -hmm. okay? Now we're talking about somebody's health with dollars. And where is, you know, the, again, the taking, anything that's a, an essential service, an education, shouldn't be based on the amount of money you have in your family to be able to afford to go to a, a better school yeah. if you have the intelligence. Health saying, is the same but thing. But we know, we know that there are problems with the Canadian the health care system. The reason there are system. problems with the Canadian health care system is the same reason there are problems with the American health care system. It's both money. One doesn't have enough no, and one is being selective. But you're saying it's all that about the money. Dollars. Open it up all the way where everybody can have it equal without the money. Your problem well, is that's done. That's what you guys have here. You call it free health care. It's not. But you, get, it's you don't not, get but, very good care for that. But it's not free health care. And yours is not free health care. This is not free health care. I would we agree with you want on free that. Oh. Here's what's Someone's happening. Someone's got to be paying for it. I mean, when you say free health care, someone is paying for it. In yeah. Canada, every single person who earns a paycheck is paying and I think, for your Medicare system. And a good example the, the of that. The entire system is flawed, but the American system is just as flawed the other way. See, I would question the whole premise of, well, dollars and health care is a bad thing. I know that's a knee-jerk reaction people have. Profits are bad. But it is the pursuit of profits that has made American health care the best health care okay, system in the and, world. And, and because look, people want to reap rewards. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have they Michael Moore rewards, who's running so movies innovative. after movies, talk, documentary after documentary, saying how bad the health care system is. Look at what's going on in your and country. You know he gets treated? He gets treated in the United States. But but look at where you look at look at the other things that are in your country that are going on in your country. You have people foreclosure after foreclosure after fore, foreclosure. All these empty houses. Yet you have homeless people. That's all because of money. Agreed. Money is the separator, not the has been So screwed up by government that people are going bankrupt trying to afford their medical bills. That's crazy. The government caused that. But government's run by business, though, Ritu. Government's run by business. We all know the government is all a big corporate business. We know that. Everybody knows. government government is not government anymore, it's corporation. So really, it's the business running the government. So you're saying the business that's running the government is bad at running the business. Well, businesses should not be running government. I think we can agree on that. And do you, would you say that in the government, in the U.S. government right now, business is running oh, the government? all sorts of lobbying. We have to stop that. Would you but say, that though, that it's a corporation? The, the solution is not to have more government control. We've, you guys have tried it in Canada. It hasn't Work. So what you're I saying is more business control. I to four months to get my, you know, my, uh, my hip surgery. That's insane. It's painful. It's agonizing. It's I agree. Suffering. The only thing you that's stopping is system. money. I agree. The only thing that's stopping. So take away the money altogether money and allow it for everybody. Money is what is so that American health care is better. Money is you what is made so that okay, American okay, health care okay, is guys. going towards the selected, the what? few that can afford guys. it. That's money is the stopgap. It's not the entrance. It's the exit. Now, it's wait. what's slamming the door. It's not what's opening the door. Surgery, it's become more affordable for more people. Over you knew time. this was going to happen. Wait a sec. Now, Ritu, I, I want to ask a question because, uh, you know, I mean, we can argue, you know, I want to get down to the meat of this and, and, and really, so my question to you is this. Do you believe that everyone, regardless of how much money they have, should have access to health care? Equal, equal, no. equal. I don't believe you that you are guaranteed health care. You have to earn it like you have to earn everything else in life. You're not guaranteed it by anybody else. Health care doesn't grow on trees. Somebody else has got to provide it. If you have it. a child who has multiple uh, sclerosis or something like that and you run into that situation, okay, and you can't afford it, mm -hmm. Okay, and you will at that point say, I don't think my child should be able to because I can't afford it. Well, I will have to convince other people to give me charity. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you do fall okay, on hard and, times. Okay, and you know but what? Your child needs medication now. Your yeah, child right. needs medication now. It's going to take you months to so fundraise. Charitable. Charity is not the issue. I mean, there's so many charities in the United States. There's so many charities. There's never an issue. Why should you even have to do care. that? Why should you even well, have to do that? The, the alternative, alternative is open it up. The open it up and allow it for anybody who needs it. Takes it, takes the money from somebody else and gives it to me. How is that right? Doesn't that person have a right to his money? Doesn't that person have a right to pursue his own life? Doesn't, My problems okay, are not so your problems. Are you problems. saying that everybody has a right to their own money? That's 
takes precedent Absolutely. over equal care for everybody. You have a right so, to your property. If you want to maintain your life, honey, it's there your is no such thing as owning property. Who says the border is here? Who says and that? America, Let's challenge we have that. Property rights to a certain degree. They're and those are being it. challenged now too. They're being challenged now too because a lot of people are challenging that. All of those are starting to crumble. They shouldn't be. Property rights are important. I mean, if you go out and you work hard and you earn money, that's yours. You earned it. It do, should be yours to do what you want and with then, for your life. And the life. more that have that money at the expense of somebody else, the more they have to live in a gated community, have guns. It's okay to have guns in the U.S. too. And because it's to protect I yourself. I feel like we're getting off topic well, here. Well, it's, it's, no, it's, yeah. yeah, it's the talk, same let's, thing. It's the same thing. No, let's How talk, talk let's talk about, let's just, let's let's bring it back. Okay. And let's let's talk about health care because we, sure it is we, 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 it acknowledge, is we acknowledge that there are problems it's with separation. Canadian health there's problems with the Canadian health care system. There's problems with the U.S. health care system. And I think that the problems... It's the same. Isn't it the same? Equal access to all. She's saying it doesn't, shouldn't be equal access to all. So there's a fundamental difference. Well, you do Wait, have equal access in the sense, like, if I want a gallon of milk, anybody can get a gallon of milk. It's universal milk is out there it's as long not as you equal. can pay it's for not, it. It's not, as long as you can pay for yeah. it, that doesn't mean it's equal, though. Well, it's not if anyone else's responsibility to pay for it. Someone's got to pay for it, right? You know, Even okay, I want to get down to the point here because, I mean, this is a difficult conversation yeah. to have. It's, and it's you very must, obvious and you, to and me. It's and not you, difficult. You, uh, you know, I think... A, probably encounter a lot of people who offer you the same arguments as these okay so but I want to get to the essence of, of, of the issue here um, which is well I lost my train of thought now you were asking about Ayn Rand before or health care we want to keep so it healthcare. now what we've seen here what we've seen in the US we've seen and this is going to relate to the topic, but what we've seen, um, the middle class is kind of disappearing. There's uh, a, a smaller and smaller number of people earning more and more of the income. And, um, more, uh, you know, the middle class, which was in, at, at one time able to afford things like health care. And the reason that, for example, Medicare was put in place in Canada, and this, which is, I think, the same reason why Obamacare is because people feel it's fundamentally unjust that certain people don't have access to at least certain health care. So they're trying to put a system in place to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there was a time in the United States and, and in the West in general where the people that had substantial incomes over everyone else felt a responsibility to in some way help those that are less fortunate and, and they started chair, charitable organizations, they started foundations yes. um, and that sort of thing. And it seems to me that with uh, philosophy like objectivism, which, uh, which helps people who have a lot of money that they've earned justify to themselves that they've earned that and they don't owe any responsibility to the other pe uh, pe members of society. I think that that kind of thinking has become, uh, has become, I mean, I think Ayn Rand's work has is very successful in the sense that there's a lot of people, especially those with high incomes, who buy into that philosophy. And I suspect there's more people in those high income brackets today that feel less of a need to be charitable with their good fortune than, than people in the past have. You know, I don't think money that much has to has that much to do with it. Nine Rand's point was, if you earn, you go out there and you earn a paycheck, that paycheck is yours to do what you want with, whether it's really big, whether it's Bill Gates size, or if you're just a regular, you know, just an average person, it's yours. And I would challenge the view that it's, um, I mean, you have young people. It, Obamacare is all about young people being mm -hmm. sacrificed for older, for older Americans. It's all about young people who don't make that much money. They have to pay higher uh, medical insurance premiums to pay for older people. I mean, so this whole idea of people being sacrificed, it's not that it's, you know, richer people are being asked to sacrifice. No, everybody's being asked to sacrifice. You've got Obamacare is all about making young people pay for the medical bills of their parents and their grandparents. And that's tremendously unjust. Okay. Is, so does Iron Rand have a membership base? Is that, like, there, it's, is, is that how that it is run? Is 
Uh, well, we're a nonprofit. Okay. So we exist on donations. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and and so is the um, is the average income of somebody who belongs to a group like this above average? Is that what? Because that's kind of what I'm getting from what you. You know, our donations, most of them, come from average people. That's it. People, real, regardless of whether you're on a big paycheck or a small paycheck, it's yours. And if you believe that, then Ayn Rand is someone that you should be looking into because she's the only person in history who has defended your right to keep what you earn. She's defended your right to pursue your own happiness, to not be ashamed of that, to not have to hide it. She believed in that. She took seriously your life. It's for you to do what you want with. You've got one life. Live it to your highest potential. So is there a group in, in Canada as well? Is there like a branch or a chapter in Canada? Well, not at the Iron Institute, but there's okay. a lot of community groups. The event I'm doing tonight is sponsored by one of these groups called the Toronto Objectivism Committee. Okay. So here you are. You're, you're here in Toronto to talk about the Canadian health care system. Can, mm. can you give us like a, a, maybe so, a detailed... Um, some detailed suggestions about what or how the Canadian healthcare system could be uh, changed to to provide better health care for more people. Well, to start, private health care in Canada is illegal in many ways. So even if you you know you go to your clinic and they tell you, okay, you have to wait four months for treatment, and you want to you say, fine, let me go pay for it on my own. It's illegal under the Canada Health Act to do that. So basically you're condemning people that, yes, you have to suffer. You cannot go out of the system and pay. That would be a start. Legalize private care. So let people escape the system in which they are waiting and sometimes dying. So dying for treatment. I can see I can see a point here when you say, okay, so if you open it up and say those who can afford to do this will go to this clinic in Toronto because they can afford to do, which means the waiting lines for those who can't afford it mm -hmm. will not be so much, right? It, it, so that would be one thing that I mean, you, you would say. You shouldn't trap people, and that what the Canadian healthcare system does is it traps but, people. But if some, let's say there's a hundred people waiting in the hospital for care. Okay, let's see, there's 100 people waiting for care. So if, if 50 people, like if, if somebody, if they said, okay, we could still do this, if you want to pay for it, you can go over here, and your care, it'll happen a lot quicker than if you were here. So if 50 people out of that 100 could pay for it, went over there, now you only have 50 people here, so you're going to get service faster, correct? Yeah, right. Okay, so I can understand how that would balance. But does that really mean that that's the solution, or is the whole system flawed in and of itself? The whole system oh, oh, is flawed. System you need a flawed. free market is what you need. <laughs> I, I just want to make the point that there's an awful lot of health care in this country that is not part of the socialized Medicare system. So 70 percent. Government pays for 70 percent well, of health care in Canada. Well, there's a lot of let's you're talk for about, now. I just want to say, because the way the government defines health care, right, mm -hmm. does it include homeopathy, mm -hmm. naturopathy, Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't True. include, uh, you know, all sorts of alternative healing Chiro modalities. Chiropractic, I think, yeah. is not that's included. That's a good thing, Dental right? Imagine if the government included. socialized all that, too. Well, well, well not necessarily, because I know a lot of people who would have loved to do that but can't afford to. So, again, so I don't know. It depends. I mean, but loving to do something is not, you know, okay, you want to do something. That no, doesn't mean I'm everyone saying, else has got to pay for I'm it. I'm just saying there's an awful lot of health care in Canada that is outside of the system and and... And, 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 and it's totally no socialization in, in all that, in those areas. No, there's not socialization, but there's a lot of government control. So not you don't the, have well, to socialize it, you could just regulate the heck out of it. So I wouldn't say it as, this is socialized and the rest of it is a free market. You know what I mean? And that's what we have in, in the United States. People think it's private health care, it's a free market, but no, it's really government regulating it so, so tightly, and you get a lot of the same problems that the Can you guys have here. It's just the government doesn't take ownership as it does here with socialism. It's more a fascist route where you just so, regulate the heck out of it. So I have two questions. What are you hoping to accomplish tonight, and what makes you think you are an expert on the Canadian healthcare system and the Canadian way of life and the Canadian mentality. What makes you think you can come in here and speak as an expert on Canadians when you're not an expert? On Canadians. So I'm not actually going to speak as an American or as a Canadian. I'm here, and what I'm going to be doing tonight is trying to show people that that fear that people have of dollars in health care, of profit in health care, that that is what has made health care so good. 
That is what has made healthcare so good, all the innovations we have, all the treatments we have available, the fact that American healthcare, everyone from the world, Canadians, when they can go there, what's made it good is the profit motive. And we have to recognize that because we want to improve Canadian healthcare and have it achieve its full potential. You have to recognize that it, it can only do that in a market-based system, in a profit-driven system. And it's interesting, okay, what I would like to note, to, to take um, notice of is looking at the American, American population and the Canadian population and look at who overall is healthier and what kinds of issues there are. And, and because it's my understanding that and Canadians are overall lead a more holistic type life. And you have to wonder if, I mean, healthcare is a part of our lifestyle. Health, your health is a part of the way we live our life, which is the part which reflects the way, way we think and our attitudes, right? So you have to wonder if separating it in, in that way. So I would like to know when you come and speak about, you know, comparing it to the U.S., saying that the U.S. is better, well, is that reflected in your population? Do you have people that are more overweight and more diabetic yeah, than we Canadians do? do? We definitely do. you do. have people that have more heart disease than Canadians But that has nothing Canadians to do with do. our no, health care system. That's a different that's issue. That's a different, you know? I think that's I'm a different saying, issue. I'm saying what I'm saying is I don't think it is. I think it's part, a byproduct of. Mm. Maybe the, those I think there's other factors because those, they don't have the equal access. That's well, what I'm saying. I don't think so. I don't no, think. No, it's because we have very easy access to sugary food. <laughs> well, <laughs> which isn't a bad thing. It's just. It's, it's, just but want, again, that's because of the whole market. You thing, know, I want right? to make it's, a point. That, that food's cheaper. That wanna, food's cheaper than buying right, organic. No one's holding a gun to anyone's head telling them to buy it. That's either. right. That's. It's I, just the culture. I want to make a point about that's that my I point. think it's is the going culture. to support actually what you're saying, and that is that in in Canada, with our socialized. Uh, med Medicare system right now. What happens is the government, first of all, can't does it like is doing everything to not spend any more money, right? In Ontario alone, I think the the health care portion for Medicare in Ontario is expected to be over fifty percent mm -hmm. of the whole mm -hmm. provincial budget if it isn't already, and that number just keeps going up because you know we it's technological medicine. We're spending mo more money on very expensive machines and then the whole drug thing. And the, what I wanted to say is that we're not going to add homeopathy or naturopathy to the healthcare system because the government's trying to sp not spend any more money, right? Right. So what this does, it, it rigidifies the whole healthcare system because if, if people are moving away from drugs or, mm -hmm. or pharmaceuticals as part of healthcare, well, they're not going to do that within the socialized Medicare system because it's rigid. It's not adding homeopathy or other treatments to the system. It's just going to try to maintain the status quo. And it's influenced by lobbyists, frankly. The, 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 the pharmaceutical industry, you know, a few lobbyists there talking to government policymakers. And guess what? We stay with the drug. Well, there's, yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of talk right? about kickbacks too. So, well, sure there is. I mean, that's why you should want to pay for your own healthcare. I mean, what does the Medicare system do? It takes your money, and now you're at the mercy of the government, and the government's going to decide what kind of care you can get, when you can get it, whether it's going to cover certain treatments that you might want. But your money's in that system. Mm -hmm. You should want a system in which. You have control of your money and you can spend it on what you want, what's important to you. And that's the worst part about the Medicare system, that you don't have actual control now. So your what, money's in a system where someone else is making the decisions. You shouldn't want that about your so, health care. So what you're saying, if I'm understanding this correctly, is very similar to the financial advising. Instead of ta asking or relying on your company to invest your money for you when you put a certain amount of funds away for investments, right? Yeah. And, we, and some people do that. Instead, take that money, give it to a financial advisor because it cu it cuts to me. It's custom made. That's what you're kind of talking about, right? It's like taking care of your taking your health into your own hands by being able to choose what you're paying for. Yeah, I mean, you should have the choice to do that. In Canada, right now, you don't have that choice, and that's wrong. Okay, so again, I think this is really two sides of the same coin. I, I, I think there's no question here that there is definitely an issue with mm -hmm. the healthcare system, and mm -hmm. but I think it's through I think it's through North America. But I, I don't, I don't get that what you're proposing is any more the solution than what Canada has going on. Something's got to well, give, for sure. Well, it's not in Canada, and American healthcare is better. So you have to think what made it better, and it's not perfect. There's well, all yeah, sorts but, of but issues. what I'd like to and ask, what though, it better according is, to who, Ritu? According to who? Yeah, like, I, I would like to take. I don't think it's a right poll. to say that it's better. Because sure. So let me qualify what I mean. Who, 
who's Let saying me qualify that. what I mean by that. So I'm talking just about the quality of care. So mm -hmm. I take wait times to be a serious issue, right? I mean, if you have to wait four months versus three weeks, that's a huge quality of life issue for you. You could get much sicker during that time. Your productivity, you know, your economic productivity is affected. So that's a big issue. Yeah. And no doubt you can get care quicker in the United States. So that should really mean something. And yeah. the other thing that really means something to me is when you get really sick. So say you got cancer. Well, the United States, it's not a competition. Every other country combined, your five-year survival rates in the United States are way higher than in any other country. Those are meaningful statistics. And I, and I get what you're saying from a system perspective. So if you look at those numbers, but if you go to the ground mm -hmm. and you ask people on the ground, yeah. and so let's ask, you know, a thousand people in each state how happy they are. Ask randomly in each state, and I think, and, and to me, that would be my test. You don't have to ask. You can't. You should ask people who are healthy. You have to ask people who are sick, and the people who are sick, they're the ones who need the best health care. They're the ones who suffer under the under any social. I'm talking about. In, I'm, I'm talking about in the states, going into the states yeah. and asking the people on the ground. So sure, ask people. Take anybody who's had to, to experience the health care system and ask them if they feel they have a superior health care system. Yeah, and if you're sick. You want to be in the United States and ask anybody sick where they want to go. It's why every, you know. But you know, if you go to Harlem, hun, if you go to Harlem mm -hmm. and you ask those people, mm -hmm. okay, and, and if they don't have the money, I don't think they're going to say we have a superior system. Actually, I have to say too. I think if you ask most Canadians, mm -hmm. they're going to say that they're fairly ha happy with the Canadian yeah, healthcare that's system. True. So I think that's the true that's test, true. not the system. But that doesn't mean that everyone knows what's good for them either. You what, know I what I would say, mean? if you could. Go and experience the other side, mm -hmm. okay? And then you come out saying the same thing because now you have both sides because I think it sounds like you're very one-sided. What does that mean to experience it? Does that mean I should get sick and have to wait no. months and months no, no, and no, months? No, I don't want to no. experience that. No, 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 I don't no, want I mean, anyone to experience that. No, That's the point. I mean, go into those areas and live with those kinds of people. I'm not saying you get sick, but be with mm -hmm. those kinds of people to get a feel because I agree with what she's saying. I mean, on the news yesterday, there is a truth to what you're saying. On the news, there was a girl in, from, in Canada and she was going to Parliament because she wanted to get a drug for her, I think she has MS, and it costs, it costs her family $6,000 a month that they don't have because they have to pay for it. Now, this is something there, it's not covered by the Canadian health care system, and their parents are paying $6,000 a month. So she's made, her whole school went there and, and are trying to appeal to the government to say, my parents can't afford this, okay? Um, so what, what am I supposed to, so she's asking the government to give it to her. Okay, so in a way, it is even like that here. I mean, if you step back, nothing But what would you say to her? What would you say to her? I would say nothing. If you step back and look at it, nothing has improved the lives of the poor. Nothing has improved their standard of living, like capitalism. Capitalism So you're okay, the at the so end of the day, Rita, at, at the end of the day, you're okay with saying to her mother, you're okay with saying to her mother and to saying to that little girl, I'm sorry, honey, if you haven't got the money, you're just going to die. No, you're okay with saying say that. Is, that you should be advocating for freedom in health care. That's precisely what you don't have in health care, which is why you're in this terrible, terrible situation. But she can't pay the $6,000 a month. That's how much yeah. it would cost. Yeah, and why is it so expensive? Because of government control of health care. That's the point. In, in the beginning, it will be expensive, though. As those, let's yeah, say what you're saying is, is true. It is okay? going to be expensive. There's going to be a huge gap. There's, there's a lot be a of huge things gap. that Steve Jobs can probably, probably got in terms of his health care, I'll never be able to get. What, what what can I possibly do to do for that besides say Steve Jobs you pay for my health care now I'm not cool with that I think Steve Jobs has a right to what he's earned if he can afford better so you so at the end of the day you're okay with saying to that little girl I'm sorry honey I know you don't have the money but you're just gonna have to suffer because well, that's if, just the way if it is people willing to give that person charity and there are. There's not an issue. I mean, we're debating well, she's, a situation she's that doesn't exist. Well, she's raising funds now. They're raising you funds know? now. Yeah, but it still takes time. Things take in the time. Meantime, I mean, what, what is the solution? Things take are much faster in the United but, States. But <laughs> They're a lot slower in Canada. But we know they, this. Well, there's also one-tenth of population here. So the chance of raising the funds here are going to be a lot less than the chance of raising, because there's ten times we're more population. We're talking about community here. Come on. I mean, that's not but really But it's all issue. part and parcel. It's all part and parcel. People don't have the money. People don't have the money because we work in a social class. If people don't have the money, then it's even worse that the government is taking it away from you and giving it to somebody else when you don't have enough. Isn't that what we're talking about? No. That's what Medicare is. If you're saying these people don't have money, well, then why is the government taxing away everything that they have to pay for other people's health care? That's more of a reason to let people keep what they earn.
if it's not enough, the costs for medication and medical are through the roof. True. Because They're of through government. the roof. I agree, but in the interim, so even though what, even if your solution was the right solution, in the interim, there is going to be a lot of suffering and people dying as a result of it, as those as it finds its way. What do we do to mitigate that? Well, I think charity has never been lacking in the United States or in Canada, I don't think. So I think that would be it. But for me, the whole issue is which direction should we be moving? And the direction to be moving in is towards freedom, towards allowing people to have more control over their health care dollars. So you and don't feel there should be a balance be. somehow. So you think it's not a little bit of both. It's that. No, because it's your responsibility to pay for your health care, to take care of your life. It's not anyone else's responsibility. Okay. Well, Ritu, I think maybe this is a little taste of what might be happening tonight, unless it's all objectivists at the event tonight, which is, uh, if we can see that poster again, uh, it's at the Earth Sciences Building at the U of T, 5 Bancroft Court. What time does that start tonight? It starts at 7 p.m. Okay. Well, so, and I is, hope you have more support than what I was giving you here I today. I hope you get questions like this. I mean, these are hard issues and they're controversial, and you have to have the conversation. Okay. And it's a good, it's a good topic. And at the end of the day... I, well, you we know what? The same hey, thing. Our, our health care system is going to fail at some point, or the, or the finance of the government is going to fail. But that's there's the no direction that it's that headed. Another solution that's better I'm, is out there. Well, we have to find a better solution. I agree. Absolutely. So thank you for coming to Toronto and uh, being part of the conversation and about trying to it. find a better solution. <laughs> and of course, people can get more information at the objectivismto.com website. Should be interesting. Yeah. And so, Ritu, thanks a lot. Thank and, you for uh, coming. Good luck Thank tonight. Thank you. And we're going to come back. Uh, we, well, actually, we've got a little um, one of your videos talking about health care. Oh, great. That uh, Conrad sent us. So we're going to play that now. Come back with our next guest right after this. Awesome conversation. Healthcare reform is an important issue in America today. Unfortunately, many people are exposed to a limited perspective. I think you need to know about alternatives that work. Alternatives that are consistent with the American heritage of freedom. Hello, I'm Dr. Arthur Astorino, Chairman of Americans for Free Choice in Medicine. I'm going to take you now to one of our national town hall meetings on health care reform. This program features Dr. Leonard Peikoff. Dr. Peikoff is a noted philosopher, lecturer, and author of many books, including Ominous Parallels, The End of Freedom in America. Dr. Peikoff. Good morning. <clears throat> Most people who oppose socialized medicine do so on the grounds that it's moral and well-intentioned, but impractical. In other words, it's a noble idea which just somehow does not work. I do not agree with that approach. Of course, socialized medicine or government control of health care, which is the same thing, is impractical. It does not work, but it is impractical because it is immoral. This is not a case of noble in theory, but of failure in practice. It's a case of vicious in theory, and therefore a disaster in practice. So I'm going to... <clears throat> I'm going to leave it to others today to concentrate on the practical problems which are legion in the, in the Clinton Health Plan. And I want to focus on the moral issue at stake. So long as people believe that this plan is noble, there is no way to fight it. You cannot stop a noble plan, not if it really is noble. The only way you can defeat it is to unmask it, to show that it's the very opposite of noble. And then at least we have a fighting chance. Now what is morality in this context? The American concept of it is officially stated in the Declaration of Independence, which upholds man's unalienable individual rights the term rights, notice, is a moral. It's a moral, not just a political term. It tells us that a certain course of behavior is right, sanctioned, proper, a prerogative to be respected by others, not interfered with, 
and that anyone who violates a man's rights is wrong, morally wrong, unsanctioned, evil. Now, our only rights, our only rights, the American viewpoint continues, are the rights to life, liberty, private property, and the pursuit of happiness. That's it. According to the Founding Fathers, we are not born with the right to a trip to Disneyland, or a meal at McDonald's, or a kidney dialysis, nor with the 18th century equivalent of these things. We have certain specific rights, and only these. And why? All legitimate rights, if you notice, have one thing in common. They are rights to action. Rights to action, not to rewards from other people. The American rights, the original American rights, impose no obligations on other people, merely the negative obligation to leave you alone. The system guarantees you the chance to work for what you want, not to be given it without effort by somebody else. The right to life, for example, does not mean that your neighbors have to feed and clothe you. It means that you have the right to earn your food and clothes yourself, if necessary, by a very difficult struggle, and that no one can forcibly stop your struggle for these things or steal them from you once you have achieved them. In other words, you have the right to act and to keep the results of your action, the products you make, to keep them or trade them with others if you wish, but you have no right to the actions or products of others except on terms to which they voluntarily agree. To take one more example, the right to the pursuit of happiness is precisely that. The right to the pursuit, to a certain type of action on your part, not to any guarantee that other people will make you happy or even try to do so. Otherwise, there would be no liberty in the country. If your mere desire for something, anything, imposes a duty on other people to satisfy you, then they have no choice in their lives, no say in what they do. <clears throat> they have no liberty. They cannot pursue their happiness. Your so-called right to happiness at their expense means that they become rightless serfs. In other words, your slaves. Your right to anything, anything at all, at the expense of others means that they thereby become rightless. And that is why the United States system defines rights as it does, as strictly the rights to action. This was the approach that made the United States the first free country in all world history. And soon afterwards, as a result, the greatest country in history, the richest and most powerful. It became the most powerful because its view of rights made it the most moral. It was the country of individualism and personal independence. All right, we're back here on the show, and uh, we have Lynn Adamson joining us. And Lynn has been here before, but we're happy to have her back. I think we could have used Lynn in the last interview. Actually, yes. <laughs> it's funny that you should say that, because yes, we could, because she does uh, conflict resolution. And uh, Lynn, I don't know if you uh, saw that last thing, but what was Sandra doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lynn. Well, I think uh, one of the essences of, of resolving conflict is understanding. So we need to be able to understand where another person's coming from, what we, where we might share some common ground. We need to be able to get curious and ask questions. Mm. And I mean, you did that as well. I mean, we still have differences. The thing is not to take those differences as um, Personally, uh, personally or? yeah, exactly. Not, not as a judgment on us, and not mm -hmm. really a judgment on them, but to how do people come to that perspective? What's influencing that? And are they willing to actually hear the perspective where you're coming from, too? Because the more open we can be about where we want to go, in the end, the more likely we are to come to a win win yes. conflict resolution. Yes. yes. Now, have you ever, in your line of work, have you ever um, come? across a situation where there was no common ground with the two parties when they just don't see it eye to eye and there's no happy medium there are often times when people don't resolve the conflicts even if they bring them to our service they may not resolve them the majority yes the majority if they go to mediation they will come out with a workable agreement and that's especially true in workplace mediation also true in neighbors mediation the really most important factor is that people want to resolve the conflict. If people want to resolve the conflict, then the, 
the conflict resolution and training service can be helpful mm -hmm. to them. The mediators can be helpful to them. And we also do training, and people can learn better skills so you don't escalate the conflict in the first place. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't guarantee you're going to come to the same conclusion as the other person, but you at least <coughs> cannot, but you can refrain from doing any more damage. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You, can you may at least mediators. mediate that yeah. too. Mediators will help you have a respectful dialogue and okay. see where you can, do have common ground and can move forward on that. Or at least you've had that conversation and nobody's harmed. Everyone feels respected. What happens, Lynn, though, when the other person just won't listen? <laughs> that is really tough. That is really tough. Okay, can I start to hit you? <laughs> we, have, uh, we have different styles. People have different styles in conflict resolution. There's a style we call kind of competing. And any of us can get into it. If we feel strongly about something, we can get kind of competitive about our views yeah. and shut out another person's perspective. And that kind of keeps us isolated, though, right? Because we're not getting that dialogue. Um, and you can't make a person who's feeling competitive about their perspective listen to you and understand you. You can invite them to do so, but they need to feel, uh, they also need to feel that there's some value in it. So that people understand the reason why. Like, why would that person listen to you? Why do they need to hear your perspective? Can you point out to them that you notice? One of the favorite phrases that I use a lot is, I'm noticing. So I'm noticing that you're keeping repeating that thought, and I'm, I'm feeling like you're not necessarily mm -hmm. understanding my perspective. Mm -hmm. Can I summarize what I hear you saying? Mm -hmm. And then would you summarize what I'm, what I'm trying to say so we can see if we understand? Mm -hmm. There's Great. a lot of anxiety in conflict because people are concerned about the outcome. Who's going to win? And, uh, or am I, my needs are threatened in some way. My needs are threatened by the conflict situation that we're in, so I get anxious, and then I'm really concerned about the outcome, and then it escalates, okay? People get defensive, and then they attack, can't defend. However, if you slow it down, and that's the kind of our number one uh, recommendation, is slow it down, get curious, and try to understand what's behind that conflict for each person. What are the needs that that person feels are threatened? Mm -hmm. um, what are the values that that person is holding on to in that situation? And that you get to express those two. And when you feel that you understand each other, then you can maybe come up with some options that would meet your needs. So we're really focusing on meeting needs. Rather than having ideological same viewpoint, it's like, what? how can we meet our needs moving forward? So, oh, go ahead. You had a question? Well, yes, I did. Okay, go for Thank it. Thank you for letting me <laughs> say something. This is your show. Sure. <laughs> go for it. Well, I mean, for example, our last conversation that we had... Yes. It was a uh, political conversation, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and uh, you know, sometimes I think there's nothing more difficult for people to give up than their worldview, right? So exactly. people have a True. a certain outlook, mm -hmm. and they're very invested with that is whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but what I uh, my question is a little. So when you're offering the services here, right, right. through your now, is it a business, or are you doing this through St. Stephen's? This is a community Stevens? program. It started in 1985, the Conflict Resolution and Training Program. And St. Stephen's is a community house that offers all kinds of programs for housing and homelessness, for youth, for employment and training, for uh, language programs. Um, yeah, they have an award-winning youth program. So we offer a lot of programs, but in 1985, this was founded. And I was there. I was one of the original people in the the first five-day training that we had in, in starting that program. So I've wow. So were you then. a trainer or were you being I trained? I was in the training, being trained by the people from San Francisco who had a program called Community Boards, and they'd used it in San Francisco to resolve neighborhood conflicts so that people didn't end up calling the police or killing each other because people would get shot over a parking space conflict. They you know, would what? Seriously. Well, there's a lot of guns, as you know, in the United States, and, and here we have some guns, too, and lots of violence that happens when people feel threatened and feel like their needs not being met, it can escalate. So they wanted to build capacity in the community in San Francisco, and they wanted to give people support. When they wanted to resolve a conflict, you can come and sit down with community, with neighbors trained who will help you. And so we were learning from them. So I, I did that five-day training and became part of that program. I was on the steering committee for the program, and I'm very happy to see it has grown since then. Wow. And, yeah. And, and so that must be so gratifying for you mm -hmm. to see at the end when you're having this conflict. Like if, you know, if for for Ritu yeah. and myself, if at the end of the day, because I think, I think, I don't think we resolved. 
No, anything. No. But people do have differences that you're not going to be able to personally resolve. Like when we sit down, because it's a bigger question, it's not just up to you and her, right? Right, true, um, true. Where we do our services primarily, it's with the people in the room. So if I'm, I'm living here and you're living with my neighbors, then you and I, we have a, a very specific problem that we want to solve. That's where we focus. Or if, okay, if we're in I the see. same workplace, I see. then it would be a matter of, you know, Hugh, you and I are in the same workplace, but we had an incident between us. It would be a matter of sorting that incident out. Now, how do we want to work together so we both feel that we're respective, we both feel that's productive, we're both looking forward to coming to work, right? Mm -hmm. We want, and, and for the neighborhood, that we're both happy living uh, in that neighborhood and we want to come home to people want and to not come home be and feel afraid safe that they're going to be, you know, be throwing eggs at me or something. Exactly. So you have a stake in resolving it. Um, certainly the earlier we go at these relationships, when there's a problem, the better. And it's also one of the reasons why we want to build positive relationships to start with. You want to do team building in the workplace, or you want to go to your neighbor and make friends, uh, or you know, introduce yourself at least, so you know the people on a, in a positive and friendly way, and then when there's a conflict, it's easier to talk. Because we don't like it, we, we tend to associate it with those people don't like me, mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. there's an issue we, and we can talk about it. So do you find though that, it obviously it takes, one person has to come to you and say, okay, look, I'm having a problem with, yeah. say, my neighbor. Right. Okay, so, so somebody has to come to you. Now, who approaches the other person? Or do both, like, I mean, it's, it's unlikely that both are going to say, you know what, let's resolve this and let's go here to resolve it. So is it usually one person who comes to you and says, okay, look, and I'm having a problem and I, and I don't know what to do? Yeah. Usually it would be one person that would come to us in a, in a neighbor conflict and then we'd need to have the contact information for the neighbor. We might send them a letter or give a phone call or we might say to them, would you prefer to go and, and talk to them yourself and propose this and give them our, our contact information, our literature. It's... Uh, it's certainly easier in a workplace in a sense because usually mm. people are recommended to go. By oh, they really have no choice, manager. right? Yeah. They, we always say it's voluntary and it should be voluntary, but there is certainly an expectation in the workplace that you're going to work to resolve the conflict. We always start with an individual um, interview first because we want to assess that it is appropriate for mediation. Let's say okay. it's a harassment issue. We don't want to. We want to know that people are going to be able to get somewhere in the mediation, like, or one person sees it as harassment, the other person doesn't. So we want to um, talk to them. They need to have okay. some understanding of what the issue is and what they're going to need to be talking about. And okay. we need to believe that they want to resolve it. Like I said, that's the most important thing. Do they okay. want to come out ahead in terms of the relationship? So I can see, go ahead, do you have a question? No, cool. So I can see in, in a work situation where that common denominator would we want to resolve this but in a neighbor situation and maybe that's not a very common maybe you get mostly work situations but in a neighbor situation i mean what if the neighbor says i don't care yeah. this is not Does uncommon that, that people will think you know okay so i'm practicing piano in my home and it's bothering you like that's your problem not my problem However, if it's escalating and uncomfortable, it affects everyone. So part of what we do in the initial interviews is we explore how it is influencing that person. So let's say you're mm. unhappy. How am I going to be happy living next to you if you're unhappy? And if I learn a little bit more about what your concerns are, let's say you work shifts. You know, mm. let's say you've got to sleep in the afternoon and that's when I'm practicing the piano. Maybe you and I, by learning a little more about each other's situations, we can work out an arrangement whereby you get your sleep and I get my piano practicing. So it's really the willingness to sit down and learn a bit more and actually care that caring does matter, you know, that your neighbor's happy. And often in conflicts we think of our needs and we forget to think of the other mm -hmm. person's needs mm -hmm. and our the best negotiation we call it principled negotiation that the most effective for you is when you're going to be kind of soft on the other person who they are like treat them respectfully and well as a human being care about them and at the same time be sure to put forward what your needs are and try to get clear what their needs are so you're not just giving in but you're not saying giving this up. is how it yeah. has to be you know this my way or the highway right, right you're right. trying to find that path in between that is mutually beneficial and uh, mm. helps you for the future as well as as whatever the current issue is so uh, i think it's really interesting that you're you've brought this in a sense a thing that started in San Francisco and you're offering right. your service now in Toronto mm -hmm. and who is a i mean you mentioned you know neighbors that might be having trouble uh, or, or conflict of some sort, but are there any other kind of uh, target 
um, people that uh, that you want to serve with this conflict resolution? We do a whole variety of programs and services. So, for example, we provide coaching. Let's say that you're a manager in an organization and you want to figure out how to better handle a certain employee um, to get the best out of that arrangement. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's been frustrating and difficult, um, and yet you don't want to give up. So we can provide coaching that helps a person understand how to best work with that kind of person. We also do training in, in personal styles. People have different... I started to, to say before about computers, com mm -hmm. people who compete. Like Sandra. And... <laughs> people who give in are accommodating. People who are avoiding. I think you're going to need to mediate. I might See, she's got to always uh, one up me. It's hard to share Lynn. space. She's always she? want, trying to one Is up that me. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have a certain effect on each other. It looks like, hey. <laughs> Why do you think he wears that? <laughs> Okay, that's not know. just for decoration, no. <laughs> because it's so become so hard <laughs> for me. Oh, I see. He's protecting himself at this point. Yes. Yeah, yes, people are armor. always hitting me on the head, Lynn. Uh, yeah, you both. <laughs> it's a pillow. Are, in a way, like you're both expressive personalities, right? I'm just looking at it and, and saying that may be one reason why you enjoy this kind of interviewing, right? So you have something in common, and yet um, sometimes we have. have conflict with people who have similar personalities to ourselves because you're both expressives and there's only so much air time you're going to trip <laughs> over each other once in a while so learning how to share give a signal to each other that you want to come in or, yeah we do that you know, we have a secret kind of signal <laughs> <laughs> so you've worked it out kind of you negotiate with each other and, and, and it, put it this way i get more bruised than he does more what bruised oh, yeah. bruised <laughs> Yeah. You know, the thing is, you can sit down after. If, if one of you felt like you were really genuinely concerned about how the working relationship was for you here, you'd want to be able to know, oh, I know how to raise a concern mm -hmm. um, Re it, exactly. without uh, making things worse. It's one of the reasons we don't go to another person and say, I've got a concern, is we are concerned that we'll make it worse. Like, if I bring it up mm -hmm. with that person, um, they what are will they react. Think of me after and that chances too. are they will react because people are very sensitive about criticism. We want to think of ourselves as good people. We try to do our best. I think everybody does. And so when somebody says, uh, I'm unhappy with something about you or about how you're, you're being in this situation, that's hard to hear. So that's why we go through with people like how you want to set up that kind of a conversation uh, so that it's likely to be successful for you in the long run and make things mm -hmm. better and not make them worse. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind you of know thing more, we do. And I don't even know if this is possible, where, but where I think something like this would be so beneficial mm -hmm. is bullying. Yeah. In schools, yeah. do you deal with that? Have you got, been able to uh, deal with any? Because I think that could have a major yes. effect. Well, we do um, we do anti-bullying training. We have okay. been doing some anti-bullying okay. training. The thing is, bullying is a pattern, and it's a pattern that anyone can learn, and it's a behavior that people can be involved in, and you can also unlearn it. So you can learn other behaviors. You it mm. helps to know what need underlying need is being met by that okay. uh, by that behavior, and how it's getting that person what they want. You know, and maybe not in a healthy way. It sounds like not in a healthy way if it's if it's imp impinging in a negative way on other people. Have you ever so had to, a, 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 per, a child, like a high school student who may have been bullied and then they're the so-called bullier? Have you ever been able to kind of mediate something between those two? Yes. We're, I, St. Stephen's doesn't do, in particular, a school-based program, okay. although there is others uh, called um, Peace Builders. Oh, okay. I think that they do, uh, for example, they do a lot of youth um, circles peacemaking circles okay so there there are the resources and we're happy to steer people to the resources that okay. they need for the situation that they have but i think what you're saying is well, if people sit down together do they learn about how they affecting another person yeah, yes exactly. and they have the exactly. opportunity to make amends because what you really want is to help develop the empathy like I myself, I, there's an incident I can think of in my childhood where I was participating in a bullying thing. Someone asked me, uh, you know, let's go kick in the little leaf house that peop the little kids have been making. And I think, you know, you're at loose ends. Did you do Somebody it? Does, I did. Ooh. Oh, yes. That's what I mean. Anybody can do that kind of thing. I was like uh, 11 maybe at the time and, and one of the older kids in the elementary school, right? So I ended up in the principal's office and we talked. 
we were never brought together with the people who we affected. But I did reflect on it later. Because sometimes you get involved in something and you realize later that wasn't something I, I really I wanted to do. Yeah. No, well, I don't want to do it. Because yeah. we choose our behavior. And that's a big focus of, <laughs> of our programs is to become more conscious about the choices we're making, about our impact on other people. And so we need the feedback. It helps when you sit down and, and do the mediation. Because I never was able to apologize to those other kids. Like, it was never set up that way. Um, at the time, because it was just like you're being bad and yeah. whatever. Yeah. You know, that's the way we Well, did I don't it think then. they had that sophisticated no. an understanding they, of how to no. resolve that, it right? It is so incredible. Like, it really, it was the 1980s that all of this win-win conflict resolution came forward, getting to yes and lots of the Harvard negotiation project and so on. And that... To me, I was so happy at that time because I thought, now we're not going to have wars. I honestly mm -hmm. thought, End you know, because conflict. we know how to yeah. do win-win conflict resolution, and it's not in anyone's interest to be blowing things up and wrecking the planet and wrecking communities, right? We should get Putin in this, uh, at this table. Uh, it's it's Putin, and I think it's Obama, and it's all of them. The like people get into using leaders. power yeah. and throwing power around rather than developing relationships. And I'm part of personally in my own time, not from St. Stephen's, but on my own time with the Department of Peace.ca. It's a, a oh project nice. around getting our government to do peace building as a positive thing. Peace is not just an ideal, you know, unreachable, unattainable thing. It's a practice. Peace is a practice. It's what we do. So, and there are steps that we can take. You know, you're talking about in schools, there are steps we can do through peace education and programs in schools that develop those <coughs> capacities in young people so that they can resolve their conflicts both in, on the playground, my children were involved in an early program at, at Downtown Alternative School, uh, Peacemakers Program, and That's learned amazing. the skills growing up, which I think that is when we should learn them. But you know what? Our program helps people no matter what age you are. If you mm. want to do better with conflict... Well, it's never too late, right? It's it's never Let's hope so, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> yeah. And I, do, I also do on my own time... Um, training in nonviolence. We do this at the Quaker Meeting House in the evenings and we teach people about kind of Gandhi and nonviolence and nonviolent social social change campaigns and how we can better affect the world around us through working together, make the changes that we need. Because really it's all about being conscious and present in our lives and, and really ma making what we want um, in our lives happen in our lives, whether it's the workplace, whether it's in so, terms of social issues. So to get back to the conversation we had before yes, with sure. Ritu, okay, yes. with what you're saying to me, all the things that you're saying to me are things that make a lot of sense in terms of the philosophy in, 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 in not just um, conflict resolution, but it sounds to me like that's a philosophy, that's a way of life, you know, developing the empath and the peace, and right. uh, even though I know peace is something you do on the, on, on the side, but it's still very much a part yeah, no, of conflict resolution. Of so, so... How would, how could somebody like Ritu, who holds her position, mm -hmm. and somebody who, like me who holds my position, which seem to be at the opposite ends of the spectrum, right. okay, and I'm not saying that she's bad, and I'm not saying I'm bad, I'm not saying one's right or the other, but how could we come together? When my, my effort is to see equal for everybody, and hers is only if you can pay for it, where do you mm -hmm. see a common well, ground where, on where something like that. What here is that, that, like I said before, it's not an issue that's just between the two of you. It's representing different streams of thought in society, and society has to negotiate the outcome, which we generally do through votes, through democracy, through you know other public processes. So what you can do is be respectful to each other in hearing and understanding what's behind the perspectives that you have and then you have the total right to go out and talk to everyone else in society and organize if you like I honestly think the future belongs to the organized who gets organized determines the future and if corporations are the most organized their values will determine our future if communities mm -hmm. are more organized those values will determine the future it's really a matter of stepping forward and and knowing that we make a difference so what kind of legacy would we like at the end of our life what would we like people to be saying about the contribution we made was it for the the general benefit was it good of others and as well as yourself or uh, see now with with what she was yeah. saying that would not apply you have to agree 
What? What she would, what what she was saying, what what you're saying is a benefit good of others. Well, you make a I choice. She would say she could say no, it is. No, I think even I mean, I know, she could. And I think uh, I don't know if this applies to your the way you approach things, Lynn. Sure. But I think the, in, there was a lot of common ground actually in terms of the ultimate goal. Goal that mm. both Which Sandra's position yeah. and Ritu's position mm. was. Yeah, they they wanted to see a good health care system, both of them. And and we just ag disagreed on you know. Way. So you know. And I even said that, you know, it's got to be somewhere in between. Okay. Right? Hugh, are you getting to say what you need to say? No. Whoops. Okay. Thank you, Liv, so for recognizing I, I, that. I and recognizing that Sandra is being a She's bad She's getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, you really, when you have a conversation like that, it makes you um, ask those questions. And that, that's, a, that's a good thing. I don't want to imply that, therefore, it's easy to talk. It's not, right? right. Necessarily. However, you have the right to do so, and you have the ability to do so in a respectful way, to disagree right. if you disagree, right. and to organize as you, as you wish. And if you were working in the same project or the same building, you'd need to come to an accommodation that way, right? right. But right. you, what, yes. what, what I are, do are have things going for you, that you questions for you? or what Yeah, yeah, I got some questions, yeah. Yes, sure. um, So when I think about what you're doing here with this conflict yeah. resolution, sure. and I know that it seems to me in so many ways it's a better approach than for example the civ civ civil law you know yes. take you know suing yeah. people in court right mm -hmm. uh, over over stuff and and uh, also and even not just even the civil law but mm -hmm. the criminal law as well yeah. for example when uh, there's a crime where there's a victim yeah. so there's a perpetrator and yeah. there's a victim and in a way that's a conflict Yes, right? it is. And instead, uh, what we do now, we take the perpetrator, we throw him in jail or whatever, and the victim is left right. without they, restitution, right? Right, and they never resolve. And their, that, yeah, it's never resolved. They never resolved. have that, that um, resolution period. Well, we do uh, a lot of court referred cases at the conflict resolution and training. There's a lot of court referrals, and we do a lot of that mediation with community volunteers, community volunteers who are trained in, the, in those skills, and we have volunteers from many different ethnic backgrounds and who are uh, speaking different languages and cultures, different genders and ages, and we bring the, we can put the right mediators on to a particular case to help those people talk, if they're willing to, once they're referred by court, because courts will often say, Courts work on a right-wrong basis, and they will often say, this is not the place for you. Your neighbors, you've got to work it out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So they, might, if they come to us, then we assign mediators. We do the individual interviews first, then we do a mediation. Maybe we do another mediation session, and hopefully they will come to an agreement that's mutually beneficial. It's a little bit hard for people because you have to kind of step back from your position. You have to be willing to look at what the other person needs as well as what you need. Right. And you have to let go of a lot of hurt because usually by the time it gets to court or even comes in our door, there's been a lot of hurt that's gone on. And you have to say, we'd like to shift this. We don't want any more pain. We yeah, want but to move in the better direction. It just seems so much better because if people, A, recognize the hurt and then yeah. are able to let it go, that's a much yeah. better situation for them as an individual than holding on to it which they might do if they go to court and win or yeah, lose, right? Exactly. And it just seems yeah. also probably a lot less expensive for mm -hmm. society as it, a whole. It's a system. Yeah. It's way more, way more efficient to do it this kind of way. It's based on meeting your interests. It's much more timely, so you're not waiting for months with the court system, and oh. you're not handing over the decision to a third party who doesn't ever know everything that you know and doesn't ever know the ins and outs of exactly what would work for each mm -hmm. of you. And that's what you can talk about with mediators. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I think it, it requires us realizing none of us is perfect. None of us is always right. We're always learners. And that we have an interest in other people also getting their needs met. And, and what we need is for them to, to respect as well that we need to get our needs met and to give each other a fair hearing. And we help people do that because sometimes when you're in conflict, you're pretty upset. And it's not easy for you to get there without the help of other people. But people learn an enormous amount when they, they go through a mediation or when they go through the training. They learn, uh, like we have this model called CLAIM, which is really about centering first, right? Calming yourself down, that's what the C is. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> the problem with, as the problem with conflict is that it tends to escalate. Mm -hmm. But if you can center yourself, calm yourself, then listen, mm -hmm. and, and um, 
to the other person first, they will calm down because actually that listening and then acknowledge. So say, this is what I'm hearing you say. Sometimes we don't want to do that because we disagree. However, we can say, look, I may see it differently than you. I think I do. Let me make sure I'm understanding what you're, what the point is you're trying to make here, what the need is you're trying to express. Then that's you C-L-A. can get information. So C-L-A, that's uh-huh. right. And the I is get more information from them or provide information. So invite information, provide information. And M is move to problem solving. So don't jump into the problem solving. Go through those steps. And it involves, like we need to center ourselves, we need to take a breath, because we are biological beings that have evolved to get our adrenaline going whenever we feel like our needs are threatened. So it's that fight, flight, or freeze going on, and you're not thinking. When emotions are running, you're really not thinking very well. So you need to slow down, take a breath, take care of your own self, get mm-hmm. centered, mm-hmm. then listen, acknowledge, and you can ask the other person to do the same for you. Invite more information, give more information, and then move to problem solving because you've got the understanding basis. So you can kind of claim the conversation by taking those steps. <coughs> Does that make sense to you, Hugh? I can see you I st- I think I need to thinking. take a workshop. You okay. <laughs> That's a lot to absorb. I know, I, know, I know you give these workshops, and, and you know it's a process yeah. for people to really yeah. get that so sure. that they can then use it in their everyday we life. We do a basic kind of a one-day workshop, and we actually call it handling conflict with angry people because sometimes we need to deal with other people that are angry mm-hmm. or we might be angry ourselves so you know that's helpful both directions and then we also do three day and five day mediation training so for people who want to become mediators and that's a very useful skill whatever workplace you're in or just for your own lives you know your own family life anything it's a useful skill to have we do those and we have one coming up a three day mediation training at the end of March March 19th to 21st we do it centrally uh, located near St. George Station downtown, and we have a five-day coming up in June, and the five-day is very popular. People really like it because you get more practice time, mm. and we include things like power and culture issues in mm. mediation, and we, yeah. Uh, yeah, we include kind of advanced uh, advanced work as well in the five-day that we don't have quite as much much time for in the three days. That's the intensive interpersonal That's mediation it. workshop. That is it. Isn't it? Yes. So, um, <laughs> and who yes. should come to this? Okay. Um, I'll just give the website too so people know. It's okay. ssco.ca. dot C-A. That's St. Stephen's Community House Toronto dot C-A. S-S-C-H-T-O dot C-A. And people can get a lot of information there both on the neighborhood and on the workplace and on the services that we'll provide for you um, in your workplace. So, um, now, the question is, who should come to this? Yes. So, and how do we know? I mean, okay, so you have some great programs. The, the three-day foundational interpersonal mediation, yeah. the five-day intensive interpersonal mediation. Yeah. Like, do you have to take the three-day before you take the five-day? No, day? no. They're uh, alternatives. Or if okay. you've done the three-day, you can come back and do the five-day if you want to strengthen your skills. People okay. sometimes come back a couple years later and do okay. it in greater depth. Okay. But you can just go straight to the five-day. So how would I know which one would be the right one for me? Five day. <laughs> I would think for anyone, if you can get the time off of work and you can, you know, if you can afford the time and if you can uh, come up with the funds um, or negotiate something you can afford, because we do have some sliding scale participants as well, okay. then you would want to take the five day. It's okay. it, You're going to get the best foundation in okay. in the skills. However, not everybody can get the five okay. days mm-hmm. or the time or whatever. And and the three days is good. You get the basic model. Yeah. Okay. Do you want a 20? No. Okay. I'm not going <laughs> to say that joke. The one day is, um, the one day it stand, is kind of standing alone. So you could do that one day and then do the mediation as well. Because the one day is more like my skills, mm-hmm. talking with you, listening with you, um, and dealing with the sort of anger in particular. You know, mm. So they work together. You know, I think it's great that the courts are actually referring uh, certain cases to you guys. Um, but I think, too, have you given thought, like, it really seems like this, you said it, it, it sort of emerged in the 80s, but it really seems like it's a whole new approach to conflict resolution. And, and as I was saying, you know, a large part of what happens in our formal uh, judicial system seems, to me, could be offloaded to a really smart an effective conflict uh, resolution approach. Mm-hmm. Have you 
given that any thought? We, we do get a lot of cases referred from court. Mm -hmm. We actually have people who go every week to private information court and pick up cases. Um, so we, we do have that. Not to say that we couldn't do more. I think we could do more, and mm. we haven't done these ourselves, but there have been people who've done mediation, for example, even in a homicide case, where somebody's in mm. life for killing your relative, wow. and they sit down, and the family, and the, one I'm, the example I'm thinking of, mm. the family got satisfaction in the end from kind of working with the other young person who had done the killing and mm. helping that person come to a point where they could lead a positive life. Yeah. Not everyone would choose yeah. that, but that they, they chose that and it was satisfying yeah. to them because otherwise you're left hanging with right. this terrible loss yeah. and how do you kind of redeem that and move on in your life? Well, I suppose, you know... We don't, like I, I say, we have never had a case like that, but I'm just saying there's a, a range, obviously. We mostly mm -hmm. deal with okay. local matters. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I suppose in a way it would be more satisfactory because it, it's more holistic. You get to be a part of the solution, whereas when you go to court, it's up to the system, correct? Exactly. Really, you're relying on something. They will something. choose the winner and they will craft the solution and it might not be what you, you. would choose and you yeah. don't have direct input into it. And you don't have no. any relationship with the other party yes. nope. either, right? That's, That's all. Right. Uh, and you may be represented hands. by lawyers, so you even have less direct, well, you probably are rep represented by lawyers. So yeah. your connection is, is quite diminished. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right, Lynn. So lawyers thanks are going to lose out on this. No pity there. <laughs> well. So, you know, we would love to hear from people. We do team building workshops. You don't have to be in conflict to come to us, right? We do preventative uh, team Good building work. And we would love to, you know, our latest, I guess, we're going to be doing training for City of Toronto employees through the City of Toronto program. Maybe we can get Rob Ford up there, you know? <laughs> we would take him. He, uh, we would take anyone who wants to take our training. Absolutely, we would. Because it really... And Doug. It's the willingness to learn and explore a, a different way of dealing with conflict, becoming more conscious. That's what we're after. Okay. Thank All right, you. Lynn. Thanks for coming Thank on the show today. So, Thank again, you. people Thank can you. check out sschto.ca, right? The website. That's it. And they can find out more and all yes, that kind of I'm, stuff. I'm, at C, I'm just CRT at SSCHTO. Okay, and we got that little video we're going to play now. That's a lot of initials. Okay, that's a lot of initials, but it's conflict resolution and training. And it's okay. Lynn Adamson, and we'd love to hear from people. So, okay. thank, thank you, you very so much. much. It was so okay, good. This is great. And now here's the video. We're going to come back with Sandra Saradisi. I feel at peace. And yes, we're going to be at peace right after this. Conflict. Every organization has it. The trick is to ensure the conflict leads to a good result and doesn't waste time, money, or morale. 42% of a manager's time is spent addressing conflict in the workplace. If unhealthy conflict goes unresolved for too long, team members are likely to leave. Unresolved conflict represents the largest reducible cost in many businesses. We can help. The Conflict Resolution and Training Team at St. Stephen's Community House provides your organization with workplace mediation, conflict coaching, team building, and facilitation. St. Stephen's has been providing conflict resolution services since 1985. We specialize in helping you to reach lasting solutions to problems and customize what we do to meet your specific needs. Contact us for more information or a free consultation to learn how we could help you manage and resolve conflict. All right, we're back here on the show, hitting the home stretch, and we have Sandra Serendisi here joining us. Sandra, your your book and Sandra's today. Y y yeah. One over here and one over there, right? It actually looks like we're two, but we're only one. That's right. Sorry, yeah, that's right. Sorry, news. we are one. Yes, Sandra Sandwich. Sandra Sandwich. Ooh, Sandra Saradisi in a sandwich. Actually, that's a beautiful name, Sandra Saradisi. That's a that's almost like a um, soap opera or a star name. It's a, it's um, it's a name I picked, oh. which I'm very fortunate because um, I came to a crossroads in my life, which in which I felt that the name I had was no longer serving me. Okay. So I was like hunting for a, for a name for a while, and when I heard Elmin talking about the new uh, three yogas that were the Devi Sattva Yoga, the Yoga of Illumination, there were three yogas under that umbrella, and one of the yogas was Saradisi Sattva Yoga, the Yoga of ah. Eternal Youth. 
Oh. And when I heard that word, it's like all kinds of harps, whistles, angelic music. I was like transported, I don't know wow. where. And I said, oh, that sounds like a beautiful word to attach to my already first name. So my journey started and I asked permission to Almin, which uh, some of you know as uh, the greatest mystic of our time. And I remember where I was when I asked her. I was in Copenhagen in, in a break, and she was coming back from uh, her little break. And I said, I mean, I was thinking about changing my last name. And she says, how wonderful. It was not a yes or a no, which I love it. It was just wonderful. So I wow. just put it out there to the universe and this wonderful being that came to assist me with the name change in the form of an attorney did all this name changing for oh, me. Oh, so you actually did the paperwork? Oh yes, my passport reads Sandra Saradisi, yes. Yeah. Wow. wow. So no karma attached anymore to any name. Wow. Yeah. That's good. Now yeah. I have to change mine. I know, sorry. So I, what, what are you going to change it to? Vone. Oh, yeah, right. Moon. That's some sort of alien or, or something. Or Brad Sluvis. One or the other. I'm not well, sure. We, Sandra, we don't have to comment on everything he no, said. No, we don't. Know? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off the hook. Yes, you are. And you obviously have listened to the whole conflict resolution with, with our previous guest, Lynn. Um, I was actually I kind of, faith. but I was busy doing a Bell Vaspata angelic healing session. A Bell Vaspata and angelic healing. So this is yeah. some of what you do, right? Yes, yes, so yes. So can you maybe describe a little bit? Well, I was calling the angelic uh, frequencies that I have been uh, a gift to humanity since 2006. And I'm a, a practitioner. Or, actually, uh, that word is kind of like outside me. I think I... Um, the frequencies, the Belvaspata frequencies. Uh, the word Belvaspata means healing of the heart, okay. which also is the name of my website. And I was so blessed to find that available. That yes. I, and it's exactly what I felt I should have as a website name. So healing of the heart is the translation for the angelic word of Belvaspata. And Belvaspata angels, they work with light and frequency together. Uh, so it's it's sort of like bringing that oneness that we have forgotten once. So many gifts come as a result of that, like silence of the mind, um, awareness, highest awareness, presence, higher consciousness, uh, effortless knowing, so you can tap into your genius. You don't have to have archives and files of information in your head and people have endless headaches and migraines mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and just fossilized thoughts carrying from the past moment to the next and totally unable to live fully the moment. So you were doing that just before you came on to somebody out here in the studio? Is that what you were well, doing? Well, I was doing it to myself and oh, whomever okay. is ready will receive. It's a blessing that it stays in the aura until the person is ready. So it doesn't limit to one one person. You can always include more, you know, whomever you wish to. It's not a requirement to ask for permission because it's not enforcing your will. It's not ascending. Mm. It's a different, it's totally a different approach, uh, more matching to the cycle that we're in right now. We're not in a cycle of uh, opposition or energy. Energy works with opposition, so that's why it's light and frequency together equals tonal luminosity. So wow, what, both of you at the same time, please hit me hard. So what is this cycle that we're in now and when that did it start? That was exactly the question oh, I was going to ask. God. You guys hang out too much together. <laughs> I'm going to exactly say what I was going to ask. Oh, my well, God. Well, it's a cycle of oneness. That's why we started telling you that you can see two Sanders, but it's only one. Yes. So it's a cycle where there's no opposition, where we, life finally can start to be more benevolent or we can actually start seeing that life is harmless and benevolent and we don't need to fight or thrive anymore. We are more in a state of allowing and surrender. Well, I think we need to bring that Ritu back here. Yeah, so you can allow her to... Um, change know, her position. To change the healthcare system. And by changing her position... Yeah. You'll to change oneness. your position because you oneness. are all one. <laughs> yes. Well, the truth is that we are. It's just, uh, as Amin would say, it's just like a mm -hmm. trick of your vision to see. We are, mm -hmm. in reality, we're not this small 
part of the physical body. We're way beyond this. We're fields of luminosity, of tonal luminosity. And, and when we start really remembering that incredible truth, then we don't need to age. We don't need to go into... Get sick? Get sick to clear or to get a message or to get an insight. And it's just life just becomes effortless. And that reminds me of how beautiful you greeted me when I arrived to the studio, Sandra. And I'm going to let you say that well, part. Well, it's funny because I was just going to say that. Oh, my oh. God. I'm, I'm seeing, seeming very flighty right now. But I was just going to because say that. Because we are one. <laughs> well, it's funny because I saw you and, and, I, and for, I said two things to you um, this morning when I was taking a shower Almine popped into my head Almine really? popped into my head and I thought wow okay I know she's coming April 9th we're supposed to be interviewing her on April 9th in case you forgot we're supposed to be interviewing her I know. I and remember. so I thought oh wow yeah, that's great and but I don't know why she popped into my head but okay she popped into my head and then I see you who is your the Canadian representative for Almine you work so closely and you you carry on her work and and then and so I was I was like oh that's why I thought of her because I was seeing you today and the second thing was you look fabulous. You look better and more radiant and freer or whatever the word is than I've ever seen you look. Oh. And that's what I was saying to you. Well, and you felt better. Oh, Put it so that way. It's amazing you're saying that. And, and you're saying that and it's like a, a phenomenon, just for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. happened. I was in Almin's uh, beautiful home in a retreat in uh, Christmas, at Christmas time. The, it was the second week of December. And... So I was, we were sitting lined up in front of her in her living room and suddenly the person that was behind me, she decides to take a picture of Almin. At the same time, I decide to stand up. So, and then she's like, Sandra, do you want to see a picture of you? And I'm like, yeah. And all I could see is all these golden yellow orange lines. Wow. And that was what I mean was just saying that we're fields of tonal luminosity. And I'm like, are you serious? I just took it. She said, you stood up at the same time I, I clicked the camera. So there was no physical body. Wow. It's just all these like little lines on top of each other. And I, could, I don't know beautiful. if I could, I could send that into the studio. You well, I wish see. we had it right now yeah, to see that. That. Be, yeah. that would be so cool. I will. Yeah. I, I have it. I can, I can send it to you. So that was one beautiful thing. That no kidding. It is. It's like it. Like right there, like where? What is there to doubt? And we all have that. I mean, it's we it, all. It's not just me. I'm not. Yeah. No. It, it was just ready to be shown. That's all. Because you stepped in, yes. basically, you to to develop that. So we might we should mention just quickly because this in, this, we're here to talk about you, but we have mentioned Almin. So let's quickly just yes. talk about who Almin is, so that people don't wonder, well, who the heck is this person? Oh well, Almin is this. Well, I, I have to. I always have to take a deep breath before I tr I try to put into words this magnificent being that uh, you had had the experience of interviewing. Uh, she is bringing all this incredible, unparalleled information beyond cutting edge. Um, and we are always on the next, uh, I don't want to say on the next horizon, but it's like we are on, on new topics all the time, mastering. Um, there is her, you know, you can find the free information about her on her diary, almeendiary.com. And she's going to be teaching a one week, uh, five days uh, workshop when at the time that she's going to be interviewed by you on the 9th. So I. In Toronto? Four, yes. Okay. Four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. No, it's. No. Five days, four, five, six, seven, and eight of April. Okay. Yeah, so you can visit her website, spiritualjourneys.com, to get more information. But um, right now, what we are, the, the biggest topics that we are studying, because we're always studying online courses with her, um, is uh, the art of happiness. Oh, I'm so delighted. <laughs> and we get, we get little clips on you know, how to cultivate this beautiful garden, and it's an attitude. It doesn't just, like, fall for you. It requires awareness, and it requires your discipline to find all these moments, and they are all moments of happiness, but it's 
just waking up and say, well, I'm hunting for happiness all day long and I'm not going to be happy until I find out my next moment of happiness, which is like so exciting. So happiness, where are you? Where are you? Under I here? Are know. You are? You're looking at me right on my face and I'm just not seeing you. But it's just these incredible tips about, you know, how to develop the, the attitude that is very simple and well known by by humans of looking at the glass half full mm -hmm. instead of half mm -hmm. empty. Mm -hmm. And we have an incredible tool, it's called the calendar of oneness, and we have a poetic tone every day, an angel and a sigil, and this really helps you to be sort of in, a, in oneness with everybody and the rest of our beautiful Mother Earth. And this um, today's poetic tone is reasons to be grateful. And one of the reasons is like I'm right here with you guys and with everybody tuning in. So it's just beautiful how all this gratitude, it just keeps piling up and becomes like a huge mountain. And what once was a little puddle is a huge mountain of gratitude wow. that just keeps growing. So that's one of the topics. And the other big topic is the, the principles of divine love, divine compassion slash divine love. Wow, that's beautiful. Okay, well, okay. Are you with us still? Here? Yes, I am. I'm I think I think he was being put into no. this place of yeah, a peaceful state. But I have a question because you brought that paper right, and we were you were going to start to do something. Yeah. Do you, is that? Well, I wanted to read at least one because okay. I, I I feel just to give a taste of what really it is incredible material that I mean brings forth and it's not to be just piled up or printed it's to be lived so we can truly change ourselves and change everything as a result we don't need to change outside we just have to change inside and I have it from all means um, writing so this one I have it's beautiful so the principle number one experience the rapture of the real touching the real and timeless core of another. Hmm. Big silence. I like it. How does that work? <laughs> well, it works when you have no mask and you can touch the real of another and the other person that has no mask either, no identities, no label, so you, no personality. Do you physically touch the person, do you mean? Are you talking through their eyes or? Well, eyes is a good spot. Because I noticed you were, tr you were doing that with him. Oh, really? No, no nothing in specific. I, I probably felt he needed more attention in that department. <laughs> yeah. Don't take it so personal, you. No, I, no. What I, I, I just felt like you were actually really trying to connect and to touch when? him. And when? Right now. When? Oh. Right after she said that, like a second after she said that. Oh, because I think because we talked about I was on a printed and I wanted to share some of the principles. Okay, and, maybe. And these are uh, so profound. It doesn't have to be a, a woman or a man or this gender thing that mm -hmm. we have developed. It's. It's, uh, it's just androgynous. It's beyond the labels of gender. Oh, I, I didn't get the feeling that it was, had anything to do yes. with any kind of sexual. I just felt that it was, you were trying to actually affect, understand the energy. I felt yeah. like it was like the energetic exchange. That's what yeah. I felt. I felt, actually, I felt a very strong. I actually want to back up a little bit. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, Sandra, so that's one principle you, yeah. Yeah. in that list of, of print. Do you want to just give us another one just to see what... Yes, uh, okay. How about I give you an, a number to choose between okay. two and eight, and then I'll read that. Choose okay, you. I'll pick number seven. Ooh. Oh, it's, it's a big paragraph, so buckle up. Okay, I'm buckling. <laughs> On whole bondage is the nature of most relationships of mm. earthly love. Since they are based on fulfilling one another's needs and shortcomings, the stability of such a relationship is disturbed when one grows beyond needing the other. The relationship of divine compassion is based on the strength of knowing that our being is our sustenance. 
I'm not translating that. Now you can take that one to the bank. <laughs> yes, and watch it grow. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Now, okay, so now these principles, again, what are they? And these, these. So the objective or the goal of these principles is to take you from, not take you personally, but take us from uh, a human experience into a God or goddess experience. So we can start living as gods and goddesses. So we, we take these principles and we just start to live them. Yes. So your being is your sustenance, meaning that you do not need anything outside yourself to fulfill you, to fill you up, that nobody's going to come and fix you or fill mm -hmm. you up. Mm -hmm. You're uh, sovereign unto yourself. Sovereignty is one of the big pieces in here. Yes, thank you. You hit that one on the head. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's... Sovereignty. Yes. In and of yourself. And I think that's mm -hmm. a big thing. Yeah, so you're not coming into a relationship with an empty heart, but with a full heart. And so they're not completing you because you're complete. You're already complete. Can you imagine? They're complimenting. They emphasize parts of you that you want to emphasize. So it's a, it's a beautiful game that you're playing instead of trying to... You get, you get to ice your own trying cake. To do, trying to not do the work, but somebody else do the work for you. Yes. That's when you're looking for your pieces outside yourself. And that's not what you or our mind... No promotes at all it's 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 doing the work yourself yes. to get to that state yes. of goddess yes and coming out of the need or god from need to sovereignty that's beautiful that's beautiful yes and we have many tools we also have the so we have the yogas as i mentioned earlier we have the angelic healing modality of the vaspata we have the the anasadma breathing techniques and you have oils. You we mentioned have the oils. Oils that release also um, the negative emotions we talked about, and the meridians. I know mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier before we started the recording, and, mm -hmm. and this lady was talking about frustration. And I said, frustration is an emotion that is held in the lung, and neroli oil. And we have the incredible oils that Amin brings from Egypt, or from Luxor, and they, she has also. Uh, um, brought forth sigils to to hold the purity and the more vibrant state of each oil. So there's an wow. angel guarding each each of the flowers. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so it, there's so many tools, and now we have most recently we see Belvaspata for um, sexual abuse. Wow. And Belvaspata wow. for um, also the main meridian that is the thyroid meridian, which holds the lowest of all the frequencies and depression mm -hmm. it seems like it's it's a common it's a common place on earth everybody seems to be experiencing depression because we do not know how to cultivate the art of happiness mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we have the angelic assistance we have 12 angels and 12 sigils to work on the thyroid to release the distortion and all the dysfunctional frequencies around the thyroid that can can make us feel hopeless and depressed. Um, the the other emotions is feeling uh, suicidal tendencies mm -hmm. and in despair. So those are the four emotions in the thyroid. You mentioned you say angels and sigils. Sigil. S -I -G -I -L, sigil. The sigil oh. is the angelic writing that in a way is like a translator of the angelic frequencies into okay. our bodies. Okay. So okay. they're like keys that open and release the distortion that we're holding in that particular wow. spot or a particular emotion or a particular uh, attitude that we may be um, holding on to. Mm -hmm. And with this powerful uh, sigils, we're able to shift our perception and when we change our perception, we change our reality. Of course. I'm really, uh, it's really interesting you mentioned the thyroid thing, just because I, I'm hearing from a lot of people these days about thyroid problems of one kind or another. You know, some people are doctors are saying, oh, you have to have it removed, or you need to take, uh, I don't know, thyroid pills, pills. or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the rest of your life. But, you know, people want to keep their thyroid right Absolutely. It's, it's an essential part of our body right yeah. so what can your approach to the thyroid just as an example uh do for somebody that's having thyroid problems well so we have an oil a specific oil that works with that and is the oud oil o-u-d 
and for the most part the, the oil the, the oils are the plants come from Egypt it's specifically the only one would be the only two that are not from Egypt is the rose oil that has a combination of Bulgarian Moroccan and Egyptian or uh, rose and then the wood is um, a tree that comes from the uh, agar tree a g g a r and is the resin from the tree this is not a flower and so the oil that comes from that is called O-U-D. Oil. Is that in Mexico? Where is in that? In Arabia. Oh, in Arabia, okay. Yes. Okay. And, it's, and then the, the trees have to be carefully selected which one has the right resin. So it could be very expensive. You can Google and there are like people like spending thousands of dollars in a, like in one on oil? Mill, on the milligram of the wood without knowing. This is just because the, this oil, they smell so fantastic. And the gift is not only for yourself, but for everybody that can actually smell you, that come and hug you. Oh, you smell fabulous! You are already altering the reality. Wow! Because the sense mm. of the sense of scent of smell, as we were talking, the sense is so much more powerful than the other senses. It brings us back to the oneness in a much quicker way, the uh, that oneness before we were individuation. So the wood oil is the one that uh, helps with the thyroid issues. And the point is, uh, Almin has given us point, general points that us as uh, Bell Vaspata practitioners, because we don't have license, we don't need to get people undressed. So mostly in the hands and the feet, that's where we work or we have found the equivalent of the meridians because this works with the uh, meridians and acupressure points. So it would be like right here if you find okay. a little hole above your wrist. Doesn't matter which it's wrist. Like, so imagine you have your, like, your middle, middle finger, oh. you go in there and then okay. you would apply the oil and the, the most um, optimal times we have a, a flower clock so we have 12 main meridians mm -hmm. and there are two hours for that is optimal times it doesn't mean that you cannot work on that meridian another time but it's between 9 and 11 p.m. I absolutely love them all but this is one of my favorites so wow. the blue oil and I had a woman, literally, it's just coming to me this very second. Um, she's with migraine for days. She was visiting here from Florida in the midst of uh, divorcing her husband. And I came to see her mother. She had asked me to bring the oils. This was uh, in North York, here in north of Toronto, downtown. And at that time, um, I had that bottle in a plastic bag, but it was... Um, I think it had like leaked a little bit, so the plastic bag with the, the mm. actual bottle was there. So she smelled from the plastic bag. She instantly experienced release from migraine and uplifting wow. of her emotions. Her mom that didn't have it in the budget to buy that oil because that and the rose are a little bit the most pricey ones. She says, I'm getting that. Like immediately, like her daughter was like, wow. I didn't even have to do any Belvaspata, the oil. So when I add Belvaspata to this uh, equation, so it just keeps going on and on and on. Like the wow. miracles, they just keep ripple. Wow. Throughout. So, Sandra, like who should get in touch with you and what can you do for them between besides things like cure their migraines? Because you're talking about healing of the heart. Like really, yeah. like who should get in touch with you and then what? Well, well, how do you help oh, them? You can get in touch with me even if you have no migraine. If you have, <laughs> if you have, if you you can be is, healthy and still yes, get in touch with you. Well, definitely. Like, you know, some people say, "Well, I don't. I'm not depressed." Well, so can you imagine where you're gonna go if you're not depressed and you get this? If I, if this, all these protocols, all these incredible teachings mm. are able to assist instantly, like the people that are in the hole per se, and if you are already like floating or your life is perfect and beautiful and happy well i'm sure there are areas where you're not fully yeah. expressing yourself where you can really yeah. discover so I mean, it's not always just physical health i think it's no, like it's emotional it's maybe, yeah it's or mental. your work what if you're just so there's something in your life that's not quite yes. you're not completely if you have a fear there's lots of fears that we don't even want to look there mm -hmm. why am i holding on to this job this relationship this house this pattern, what is behind all of this? We are here, let's just remember that we're here not to become PhDs. It's great if we can do PhD while we discover the self, but the true reason why we're here is to discover 
the self in a joyful journey. So you, Sandra, yeah. are branching out a little bit on your own and you're doing your own thing. Did you know that? No. Okay. Well, I've been in, like in Canada, but now I just took that leap of faith. Because you've been studying with Almine for quite a while now, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, for since 2006. And so now you're ready to kind of jumpstart and do your own thing. Because you've mm -hmm. got a lot of things coming up. Yes. Well, I've been doing my own thing, but, but I haven't really gone into exploring teaching abroad. And I'm having, well, I'm going to be teaching in New York. Like This is so exciting. In mm. Manhattan, end of April. So I'm going to be at the Open Center and the Meta Center, which apparently are the two top places in New York. Yay. So I'm so ready to explore the spiritual community and the non-spiritual community as well. So let's just put that out there and see who comes. And I let the angel, they're my, my agents, by the way. Your angels are your agents? Yes, those are. Make, so wait a second, A-N-G-E-L, so A-G-E-N. Yeah, I know, I never Almost said that. Close. I never even said that, even to myself. They just like, actually they're promoting themselves on the show. Because it's like, no, I don't know. You know, it's really amazing how they do this. They pick the people they want to yes, of receive course. initiation, which means that gives you that, gives you that uh, authority or power to work on yourself and work on others. And it's really interesting how the people, oh, I, I invited my girlfriend, but she couldn't come, but she sent me. I'm like, really? This is funny. I know how everything works. They're yes. very funny. So I'm going to Manhattan, and then in April, I'm going to be in Costa Rica. Wow. This beautiful place you guys are. Where? Welcome to interview me every day if you want to. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Have you? May 10th in this incredible place. It's part of the blue zone in the uh, and the whole earth. Have you heard about the blue zone? No. What is it? So you will <laughs> live forever if you go to a blue zone place. Okay, forget your immortality rings. You see these? Yes. Those are immortality rings. If you oh. go to the blue zone, you won't need those anymore? Well, no. You would just... Uh, it's the magnetic frequencies of the earth are like more enhanced and longevity it's promoted so this a place in costa rica in it's called blue spirit and wow it's in the, in the, actually blue zone blue spirit so you can read and it's been scientifically proven wow. and national geographic has done their research and everything oh, there so he's writing a, that down yes <laughs> so uh, it's so affordable meals gourmet food and it's beachfront beautiful studios for yoga so we're gonna do all means teachings um, but you're doing them. I'm this is you branching yes, out. Yes, awesome. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. So excited about that and hoping. Um, and I'm sure Almin is blessing all the whole thing. Oh, my God. She told me you're going to be going to places and I'm also going to be going to Europe uh, in the summer to bring Almin's teaching. So it's a lot of. Whistler is on the list and Big Island in Hawaii. So. Boy, that's oh great. God. Yes. So I just need a bigger suitcase and that's it. Wow, you and that's to, to carry to, all the oils. Plus, you need to bilocate, right? Well, I'm doing that already. You know, that's one of my Arturian pen pal gifts. You're Arturian? Well, I have a pen pal, Arturian pen pal, and that's the gift. And that, it, and I, I have, I have tried a couple times because um, last time we were we were talking, we were talking about the Arturians. Weren't yes, we, we did. Yes, because I'm Arturian. You are. Yeah. That explains things. That explains a lot. Actually, I mean, told us on the cruise, we were just on a cruise a month and a half ago, that the Palladians are the ones that have most um, emotions, so, like humans. So don't get too excited if you're Arturian. You should be excited if you're Palladian. No. Emotions <laughs> are bad. That's Mom, why we will uh, win. Uh, he's we like will Spock. beat those Palladians. Vul Vulcan. <laughs> he's Vulcan. That's why. So... Almin was receiving some uh, messages, and, and I acquire one of the messages. So, but mm. what happened is that there is a, a comedy, a Turian comedy, that matches your frequency with with you on Earth. So pretty much what you're doing oh. here, that a Turian friend of yours is doing it out there too. And it was just I have looked at it closely with different people, and their Arturian pen pal was like spot on with the people it's including wow. mine so my she says i am a teacher but i must confess i'm also a student so i just loved her when she said that so i mean speaking arturian language mm -hmm. with this message and also she says that she studies the the ethers of the earth and 
she's also learning how to travel at the speed of thought without spacecraft. I'm like, that would suit me well. I don't need air miles anymore. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Or so, a suitcase. Or suitcase. Maybe not even everything. a suitcase. And I actually experienced that, and I told Amin as soon as I got that, like a couple weeks after, I was in Red Deer in a retreat with Amin in a hotel. And I was falling asleep, and suddenly I found myself in my bedroom here in Knoxville. Wow. And then I was like, where am I? Like that kind of not knowing yeah. where you were. And boom, I was back in the hotel room in, in Red Deer, Alberta. So it's very neat. So I want wow. to do more of that. The trial. very cool thing, though, is Almin comes to Canada a lot, doesn't she? She comes, um, well, at least two times a year. Yes, this time, she usually comes in January at the beginning of the year, but we had the Eastern Caribbean cruise. Mm -hmm. And we were with her, so that was she this. Uh, not by Did you go to St. Martin? We did. I had the airplanes just like land in my head. Yeah. They redid cool. my hairdo, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, it was like pretty. You've been there to that yeah, place, to I that beach? There. Yes, we went yeah. in San Martin, Puerto Rico, yeah. and uh, in Bahamas. That yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. We did, yeah. We know how to have fun, I tell you that. And so we received the art of happiness comes from the elves. And there's a deck of cards coming up, a deck of cards of 56 cards. So we're waiting for that. And we also received the, I mean, received the wheels of happiness. So that has not been released yet, but the divine compassion, the principles also came from that class. And yeah, it's mm -hmm. so amazing to be there like firsthand and get her handwritten notes as opposed to, you know, just, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just like fascinating to me. Uh, I'll yeah. take, I'll take on me anytime. So. Well, congratulations okay. on doing your own thing, though. Yes, it's yeah. beautiful. I'm ready, and I, th I think uh, people are also ready. Uh, oh, you're ready to do it. You, I mean, absolutely, you're, you're there, honey. Yes, uh, thank you for all that love and support. I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to bringing all of these incredible teachings so we can live not only f like humans, but we can live as gods and goddesses. Yeah, the way we're supposed to. That we were supposed to, and we have forgotten. Just a little detour. Okay, so you're going to be in New York, you're going to be in Costa Rica, and you're here in Toronto or Oakville. Yes. You're all over, and I'm assuming this information is on your website. How can people get in touch with you? Well, they can either uh, look me up on healingoftheheart.com or uh, email me, Sandra, at healingoftheheart.com or call me on my cell phone, 416-999-8339. I am also respond to text messages. Wow. Really? Yes. Uh oh, you shouldn't have <coughs> said that. I should not have. Text said messages. That. Yes. Text Sounds messages. fascinating. Did you just use phones? Yes. I'm just kidding. Technology. <laughs> so we, we're going to try to get that picture up, the tonal luminosity. Yes. Picture. Yes. Okay. And yeah, I'm so grateful for being here. As I said, another reason for today. So, can your blessing and awareness is key for living so, a aware life? So, one thing to walk away and to leave people with. Yes. One thought. One thought, um, the mind, let me see, I'm just so out of my mind right now, but yeah, let me try this again. The heart cannot open until the mind silences. Beautiful. Okay, what a great way to end the show. So mm. thank you, Sandra, for thank you coming so in. Much. Thank you, honey. Thank you, Good thank luck you. on everything. Oh, it's amazing. Thank you yeah. all, it was amazing. And thank you, Sandra, other Sandra. <laughs> doing this thing. And I just want to say I would like to invite Ritu to a talk called If It Doesn't Work for Everyone, It Can't Work for Anyone, Making Your World of Difference. I would like to invite Ayan Rand. Ayan Rand. She's Ayan not Rand. I don't think Is she's she not around. even live? Okay. So. Well, I would have loved to have sat with her. I heard she was one of the Rothschild's mistresses. Ah, I, I would like, because I would like to sit with somebody, at the, one of those um, who's in that, that organization, and I would love to speak with them and, and have a, some sort of debate and go head to head with them about their philosophies. And invite them to, if it doesn't work for everyone, it can't work for anyone. And I'd like Making to take some of those, cri so, okay, never mind, forget it. That's it for the show today, everybody. Thanks Bye. for tuning in. We'll see you on Thursday here at thatchannel.com. <laughs>